a bit like Oprah this morning, so even as people are finding their seats, um, and as we're about to start our session in a bit, I just want to appreciate um, two people who came very early, who are currently not present. <laughs> I'll have to do this later. Anyway, I'd like for everyone to look under their seats. Your bean bag, your couch, your chair, look under it. There might be something, look under your couch. If you're sitting on a couch, look under your bean bag. If you're sitting on a bean bag, if you find something, do raise it up. Let the people know. Let the people know. Let the people know. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So, okay, great, 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 great. Um, to have you all back now, I did all that um, because really it was all about where you were located. Whether or not you got the prize was all about where you are located. And this morning's session happens to be called, Where Are We Now? Where are we now? And it's a look at the status of the industry. And I thought that would be a good um, way to get us into this morning session. Okay, um, Noel's gonna talk a bit before the session, um, but it is a panel discussion. Um, and I'm sure he's gonna do a much better job of introducing everyone. As far as housekeeping is concerned, um, if you haven't gotten your Delhi get badge, ensure that you make sure that you get that. Okay, Noel's gonna come up and explain the context um, of this morning's panel. Oh, he's not. Okay. Okay, he's. But it's not of the morning's panel. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> welcome everybody. Hello. Hello, Noel. Uh, we're gonna, I feel sorry for, uh, we're gonna have a hard time up here. These people are still sleeping, you know. We're freezing. I think it's got something. We're, we're freezing you to keep you awake. Okay, we'll turn it off shortly, I promise. Um, so on Monday night, we played 10 short films, um, which was released as part of the Science Film Fellowship that we had at Gorongosa National Park last year. We asked you guys, the fellows, to vote for your three top and right through the day today, before the start of each session, we're going to play one of the films. The films that, was, that came in third highest is a film by Chisomo Kawaga from Malawi. And her scientist is Zito. And so before we start this morning's session, we just want to play that film for you. Thank you. I'm Cardar algo para poder fazer o uso eh, diário e naquele período eh, fiquei bebi água não contaminada provavelmente tive uma dor de estômago terrível me levaram ao hospital eh, fiquei por duas semanas a passar mal com eh, dor de estômago no hospital Mesmo 
everything means and on to the point they have a point that I'm going in my mind. Chama me Zeke Bandi e a gente vem se dando novidade e agora me encontro no Parque Nacional da Gorongosa a atender a minha pesquisa de mestrado que é em Biologia de Conservação. Tem como foco no meu estudo o impacto do uso de terra sobre a qualidade da água em três rios da Serra da Gorongosa o com o uso de macroinvertebrados bentônicos como de indicadores de qualidade da água. Os macroinvertebrados bentônicos são pequenos animais aquáticos sem espinha dorsal, grandes o suficiente para serem vistos sem microscópio. A sua presença ou ausência pode significar boa ou má qualidade de água. A sua sensibilidade aos poluentes e às alterações ambientais alerta-nos para possíveis problemas. Pois, os ecossistemas aquáticos da Serra da Gorongosa eles são muito importantes para as comunidades locais e para o Parque Nacional da Gorongosa, porque eles servem de meio de sobrevivência. Selecionei em cada três rios eh, dois pontos. Um com impactos de uso de terra e outro sem impactos de uso de terra. Medi parâmetros como oxigênio, temperatura, pH, condutividade, turbidez da água, salinidade. A presença dos macroinvertebrados em um determinado ponto o ecossistema aquático eles podem indicar boa ou má qualidade de água. Por isso, temos que fazer o join de parâmetros físico-químicos da água e os parâmetros biológicos para poder concluir que a água daquele determinado ponto é de boa qualidade. Após a coleta de dados eh, dos macroinvertebrados no campo, levo-os para o laboratório para a sua identificação. Só trabalhar com grupos funcionais diferentes de macroinvertebrados aquáticos e estou focado em três taxas. Até agora, a minha investigação mostrou que todos os três rios da Serra da Gorongosa ainda apresentam boas condições de saúde, provavelmente devido ao fato de as comunidades locais não utilizam agroquímicos. É incrível como essas criaturas têm um impacto tão grande, servem como sentinelas úteis no biomonitoramento dos ecossistemas aquáticos.
ao estudar essas espécies essenciais, podemos compreender melhor a saúde dos ecossistemas aquáticos e salvaguardar a biodiversidade desses ecossistemas para as gerações futuras. Whilst we're making our grand entrance <laughs> to the stage, I just want to give you one more line of context. Um, I believe at 11.30 this morning, uh, the second film will show, and then just after lunch this afternoon, um, the third film will show. To give you, um, these are profile films. Each of the filmmakers was paired with the scientist, and these are profile films that they did on, on each of the scientists. Welcome, everybody. Um, Bo, Jared, um, Caitlin, uh, Jackie, so good to have you back. The last time I think you were f physically at NEWF was in 2019. Yeah, so welcome back. The last time there was a picture up there a second ago. The last time you, you guys, you three were physically at NEWF was in VR. <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's Jared here on the left. We, we saw him, when we were looking for this picture, we saw that you even took selfies in VR. Well done. Okay. There's Bo. Nothing's changed, Bo. You still haven't shaved <laughs> from, from VR till now. And Caitlin, still wearing flowers. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Leaves, flowers, same thing. Um, it's so good to have you guys back here in person. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start off today's session with... W the, the name of the session is called, Where Are We Now? As I was walking here, uh, you know, pondering this question, I found this book outside on one of the tables. I don't know if you can see, but it says, We Are Yeah. <laughs> so I, d I thought, well, I wonder, maybe, should we have the session? I mean, they're giving out books saying, We Are Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, why are we having the session? I, I made your whole magazine. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. We're done. I really appreciate it. Thank you, we're done. Next, next session. <laughs> okay, jokes aside, where are we now? This session is a look at the current state of the documentary filmmaking industry, both locally and internationally. We would like to explore what does the landscape look like? What type of documentary films are being made? Long form, short form? Who is funding them? And on what platforms are they being broadcast on? Increasingly, this picture is no longer clear. clear. Incre increasingly, we hear that there's a complete lack of funds and that those who commission content are scared of taking risks. How do we measure success at the moment? We hear of the boom and bus cycles. Do the answers lie in philanthropy? Do we produce for digital or social platforms? Guys, we need guidance. And I know none of you sitting here right now are commissioners exactly, you know, exact, you know, but we, we're looking for advice, we're looking for guidance, but, you know, so many of us in this room are one, you know, have aspirations and we want to produce stuff and we're saying, where are we now? Um, I'm joined on this panel by Jackie Motsepe, the COO of the KwaZulu Natal Film Commission. Yeah. Jared Lipworth, head of studio, HHMI Tangle Bank Studios. Caitlin Yarnell, Chief Storytelling Officer, National Geographic Society. And Bill Gardner, founder and executive producer, producer of Studio Syncretic and who a month ago also just stepped down as the Vice President for Multi-Platform Programming 
and Head of Development at PBS in the USA. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm hoping that I can ask each of you a question that you can give us some, 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 some of your perspective, and then maybe we just open up up to a general discussion. Caitlin, I want to start with you, right? Um, <laughs> as part of National Geographic Society's NG Next strategy, one of your strategic priorities is to focus your efforts with the fewer, bigger, better approach. What does that mean for grant applications? that would fund documentary storytelling. In your opinion, if any, how does this also relate to trends and what may be happening in the current documentary industry? Sure, I mean, that's a, that's a really big question. Um, fewer, bigger, better is our strategy. We're leaning in hard on it. Um, there's, like all things, there's a positive and a negative side to it. Um, positive is we are so the negative is, yes, we're giving fewer grants than we have historic. <laughs> Am I good? Um, yes, we're giving fewer grants than we have historically, but um, we are putting more money into the field. So how are we doing that? We're really investing in bigger programs, um, people that we have a track record that we want to work with. That being said, we do have the door open for new people. We're always looking for new talent. But I will say, last year, we put over $13 million into the field in the hands of individuals. So I'm not talking about like big sponsorship of events or big programs like even this. We put $13 million into the hands of storytellers. I'm just talking, not science, just storytelling, one grant at a time. So when I say fewer, bigger, better, yeah, we're not gonna do 500 grants, but mm -hmm. the grants are going to be meaningful amounts of money. And we're also gonna wrap around you be that, you know, capacity development, travel opportunities, partnership stages, we're going to do all of that. Um, what does that mean for documentary filmmakers? Um, I think it means the same thing it means to photographers or writers or any form of storytellers. We want to make sure that you're whole. We want to make sure that we are able to give you what I hear over and over again is give you the luxury of time and focus, right? Because I believe that you don't do your best work when you're hustling and you've got seven things in production and you're trying to pay your rent over here and, and sell things over there, if you can really focus. So what's that look like? Some of our more established filmmakers, and I'll be honest about it, for me, I see this like financial advising and financial no. investing that I'm gonna make big bets on more proven entities. And then we've got our risk small seed funding. We're like, I don't know, some will win, some won't. But the ones who we know are big bets, that means we will entirely fund a feature doc. Those are over million dollar investments to one person. Um, now, you know, my neck's on the line with this too. So we're gonna do that, one, because we know the filmmaker, but two, we know that the topic of the film is relevant and it's gonna resonate. I'm not a distributor, I don't have a platform. Um, the way we work, and many of you know this is, our partner, our media partner, Disney, the biggest media company in the world, has right of first offer to anything that I fund. But if they pass on it, then I help people take it out into the market. And that can mean different things. So what does that, you know, what's working in the industry and not? I'm just gonna be totally honest, it's fickle. It's really fickle. Okay. And, and I can tell you that a thing that we've made that I think is gonna fly will sit and the thing that I'm like, you want that? Okay, cool. You know, it, it's, it's so specific on what else, is, what else is popular right then, what's in the market, who's got cash at the moment and who doesn't. I mean, we like to think that there are big trends that we can follow and track, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it can come down to like three people with their budget and what they've got on their slate. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I mean, you, you end with what with, with, with they are, uh, you, ideally, you would like to track some trends, uh, Bull, and I think I want to throw that to you because I know you can no longer speak as a broadcaster, but having recently, you know, uh, still being involved as a, as a broadcaster, you know, what are those trends? So what has been recently, you know, are there any trends that, that are, that, you know, what's the data saying? What can we, what can we expect, um, you know, we, you know, is you hear things such as the streaming boom is 
is bust and it's gone and, and so who's, you know, what's happening? Thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, I think a lot of it builds off of some of the things that Caitlin has just laid out here. It's at the end of the day what the broadcasters are thinking about all the time is the bottom line. They just are. And what you think about in that space is who's the audience that you're trying to reach. And I think the evolution of the media industry largely uh, all over the world recently has been towards what has been working that they can count on. There's so much churn and upheaval and the consolidations that are going on. It's not that the business people are making the decisions, but the people who are making the decisions have that in their minds about what's going to be successful. So what a lot of the trends have been recently is what has worked. You'll have a surprise hit that came out. You know, my octopus teacher came out and won the Oscar. Everybody was wor looking for a natural history film that spoke to neurodiversity. So you could have that because that had been a success. Now, those are the broadcast networks that are looking very much towards profit margins. Um, some of the public service broadcasters all over the world try to find niches that they can fill that aren't being overwhelmed by some of the money that's in there. Because what has happened over the last several years is all these streaming platforms had so much money, they could price things out. Even as a producer, people have probably found this. I remember when I was producing, I, I did a film in Ethiopia where it cost a certain amount of money to get access. I went back two years later, the BBC had been in there, and prices skyrocketed. <laughs> so I mean, that happens. So I think the trends that I think about, and one of the reasons I made the decision that I made, is things are getting, they, they have been getting very narrow in terms of what people want to commission because they're looking for what they know can be guaranteed to be a success. Mm -hmm. And there's so much turnover in some of the commissioning ranks. I mean, I was at PBS for 12 years. That won't happen again, right? So people are on two and three year contracts, so they have to go quickly. And there's some commissioners who, you know, they're out before their commissions have even really hit the air or seen how that success can be. So it's, it's the, the risk that people are taking in that world is a little bit lower. And when they're looking at the audiences as well, the audiences are drastically changing. I think we're all aware that the culture all over the world is just really changing very, very quickly about what people care about, what they focus on. You know, look at world events, what's happening in the Middle East right now, you know, South Africa, Bravo. People are just looking at things differently. And so the audiences that we're targeting are evolving and trying to figure out what people watch and where they watch is really important. Uh, one of the great things I had an experience of is being at PBS is that we were on multiple platforms at once, but we weren't really trying to monetize them necessarily. They have to now uh, yeah. to, to survive, but that wasn't the bottom line. So it could be experimental. And I think that that's gonna be the future for a lot of the filmmakers is really trying to determine and, and you know, to Caitlin's point, big, fewer, bigger, better. Some of those are going to be what they're going to be, especially from the streamers and the, and the big spend. So mm -hmm. that's okay. What is the other niche? Uh, and the work that you know, Jared's done and, and some of these other organizations that are really trying to find ways to tell stories to reach the audiences that can effect action, there are opportunities for filmmaking and storytelling because that's what's driving people to, to take part in things. And figuring out how that works from an economic perspective and a business perspective is something we're all dealing with. There is no secret. You know, I think if you if you really got commissioners and you know executives in these organizations to ask them what is the secret, what is the trend, they don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We're trying to do the same thing. What is going to activate and motivate audiences in ways that are productive? And so I think that there's an enormous opportunity for whether it's shorts or you know films like we just saw that can have huge impact. And what's the registration of success? I know that's one of your questions. Certainly in the states, what has always been um, the the marker is the Nielsen ratings. And you know, over the recent years, it's come clean that nobody knows what that means either. <laughs> you know, so how are we finding new ways to register successful impact and that an investment is actually worthwhile? Some of the major uh, multinationals, they have you know, profit margins and they, they're looking at it in a certain way. Some of the public broadcasters or some of the engagement uh, organizations, they have different ways of measuring metrics. I think, again, you know, Jared can probably speak to this. I'm going to put you on the spot for that. You know, what moves a success, it's, it's sometimes just a, ch a change on the ground that's much more impactful than a certain number of people who watched a certain dramatic piece of television that's really just entertainment. So what is the space that somebody wants to be in and finding a way to do that? And I think the, the last thing I'll close with is just recognizing that the people in the companies, they don't know either. We're just trying to see what audiences respond to and will gravitate towards. It might be Squid Games or you never know. That's uh -huh. just what hits. But I think it's really important to continue to do stories like we're doing here because it empowers people and 
You know, I'd love to get, you know, one of the great things about being here is I think what's changing a lot in the industry, because of younger executives, it doesn't all have to be made by a few companies in Los Angeles or in Bristol. You know, it's putting the cameras and the stories and the microphones in the hands of people on the front lines because the stories are better. There, there's more access there, and the audiences are there who actually care about that. It's yeah. not just passive sitting back and being entertained. Uh -huh. Hopefully that's helpful. That is helpful. I don't know if I feel better or worse. <laughs> But at least it's good that, you know, you guys don't know. So then we don't feel so bad anymore, you know. I don't feel so bad, like, you know, walking around, like, w wanting to put my head in the sand, you I know. I think it's, it's going to flesh out, you know, yes, it has yes. to happen, and um, it'll get there. I think even in the, in the industry in the States where, you know, where I've been working, what's successful, where's the money coming from? People are sitting on it a little bit until they really know. But I'm, I'm starting to see it come back a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not tomorrow. Yeah. Next week, but I think in the next couple of years it's going to reset. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we'll come back and circle back in terms of look for some more advice as to maybe dig a little bit deeper in terms of exactly what might be working. But Jackie, I want to throw to you. Um, it's 10 years since um, I think uh, about you to start the 11th year since the establishment of the Cave and Film Commission. You have funded over 150 films, including eight youth short films. Thank you very much. Um, in fact, so often we, we are used to hearing of filmmakers from other parts of South Africa wanting to come to KwaZulu-Natal to produce stories because of the funding that's available. Now, looking ahead to the next 10, um, will this boom continue? Uh, and two, as we move, as an organization like us is new, become, increasingly become a pan-African organization. We have fellows from 25 different countries here um, in the room, uh, dif 25 different African countries in the room. What are the opportunities for co-production and collaboration with other African countries as well from, from a local perspective? No, thanks. Thank you so much, Noel. And it's wonderful, really, to be back. I mean, 2019, that was a really long time ago. <laughs> um, I think that we saw youth when we started as a, as a very, very important vehicle, you know, that we really, really had to support. Um, KwaZulu-Natal Film Commission, for those that don't know, is a, is a provincial commission, also a funding entity uh, that's based here in the, in the province. Department of Economic Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs um, in, in KwaZulu-Natal. So everything that youth does really resonates with our mandate, um, you know, of, um, of, of, of developing the, the province, being very involved in the environment, issues of, um, you know, transformation, um, which is a real pillar of MUF, um, which is why we also thought it was important that we um, supported the initiative because you're talking about, um, you know, filmmakers uh, coming into the space who previously hasn't, haven't had the opportunity to work in the space of making nature, envi environmental and wildlife films. Um, and, you know, just from the very early beginnings, in fact, from the moment we started, it, it was a very exciting initiative. Um, the potential was there, um, and it's amazing to see how that's evolved, how that's been realized, you know, with coming into this, you know, massive um, uh, Congress uh, that you've put on. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a real pleasure to see where, where you are, you know, from, from small beginnings. So our fund um, is a fund, uh, I always say it's a, it's, it's a modest fund. Um, it's pretty much um, seed funding for a lot of a lot of projects. Uh, we fund across the board, you know, um, documentaries, features, shorts, animation. We're moving very much, you know, into the animation space. It was very exciting, actually, when you did that whole VR um, new Congress <laughs> a few years ago during COVID, actually. Um, you know, with everybody having their their VR, uh, because that's where we are looking to go, um, really seeing how we can also participate in the future of, um, of filmmaking. 
Um, but obviously documentary filmmaking, I suppose in South Africa in general, um, definitely for us, uh, remains a, a you know bedrock of what we of what we fund. We fund a whole range of uh, documentary films. We're not really prescriptive, so our uh, calls for funding are um, basically open calls, unsolicited. But we do um, have an emphasis because of where we're situated of having films that speak to the, you know, the history, the culture, the very rich um, culture of the of the province. Um, and also, obviously, you know, speaking to the to the environment, um, you know, KwaZulu Natal, you know, we have World Heritage sites, uh, you know, where you're located and done a lot of work, um, and it's important also for us to, um, you know, support uh, initiatives uh, such as those. Um, so our funding is 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 minimal, as I've said, but what it does do, it opens a gate for filmmakers to gain. Funding, first of all, from other fun funders across the country. There are quite a lot of um, funding instruments in South Africa for um, you know filmmakers here. Um, you have the National Film and Video Foundation, who are a very big supporter of youth, and I'm, you know, they, they definitely are here. I saw the representatives yesterday, and they've got a delegation of filmmakers. Critical role at a national level that the NFEF plays in supporting um, filmmakers from across the country. We have the um, Industrial Development Corporation, which is more of a, a sort of like a state uh, bank. They do sort of loans um, into films equity, um, and that funding is also available. Um, you also have the Department of Trade, and it's, it's, it's a more difficult fund to access, I'll say that as well, uh, Industrial Development Corporation, but it is available because they look at the economic merit um, of, a, of a project. Return on investment, I think everybody's looking at the, at the bottom line, but they're very, very, particular about that our fund is more of a of a softer fund we also have the Department of Trade and Industry which is a, a national rebate um, it's a rebate on the qualifying South African expenditure um, of a of a film um, you know they have certain uh, categories that they do rebate so there are pockets of funding you know um, and I think we all look to who else from that um, you know, bouquet of funding has, has, has funded you and it just gives more confidence. We're usually the first one in, you know, to fund a project, particularly if they are coming to shoot in the province. It is a condition of the, of the funding that uh, at least 50% of that uh, project, of that budget is spent in the province. Um, and that is precisely because of the economic development side of our fund where we are looking to generate, you know, um, em employment, uh, that goods and services um, in the province uh, get utilized. You know, we leverage, um, you know, funding to come into the province. So when we started 10 years ago, um, there was very little, or there was way fewer film activity that was happening in the province as a whole. Obviously, a lot of that activity is around Durban, um, but we also do encourage, um, you know, films and filmmakers to shoot across the province, you know, across the, across the 10 districts so that we ha are having an impact um, in, in, in different parts of the, of the province. With regards to co-productions, African co-productions, it's, it's, it's something that we've also, from the start, being, been extremely passionate about. Um, so South Africa has, in the range of 10 co-production treaties with them, different countries. So this is where you know, s you know, South African filmmakers can, you know, make films with other countries under an official treaty. You get certain additional incentives um, if it is ratified by the National Film and Video Foundation, who are the competent authority for co-productions. Um, for example, you get a 35% rebate from the Department of Trade and Industry and so on. Um, and then you have the unofficial co-productions that, um, that also take place. When we started, we didn't have a single co-production with any African country. Even as we sit now, I think we have one with Nigeria, and that also hasn't been formally ratified. So when it comes to the African continent, we don't have really mechanisms um, that enable us you know, to co-produce content together. 
But we then thought that we, it was important, in spite of that, that we do go out um, and look to see how we can co-produce with countries from across the continent. Our first port of call was Nigeria. Nollywood is the biggest industry on the continent. We thought it was important, first of all, to understand you know, how Nollywood works. One of the things that we've realized as we've been particularly working on um, African co-productions is that we really don't understand each other well. So we started off with Nollywood, um, honestly, on a sort of a fact-finding mission. Um, we went out to, there's a Africa International Film Festival uh, that takes place, originally it was in Calabar, now it's in Lagos. And we've been attending that steadily every year to gain a better understanding of the industry, but also to look to see how we can produce um, films together. Um, and through that, um, there are you know, two projects. One is a feature film, one is an animation, actually, series that we are working on with, 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 with Nigeria, you know, Kenya also. Um, we have been present at the, at the Kalasha. It's a, it's a market that takes place in, in Nairobi. We've been to Zanzibar, so, you know, so we're and, and we also have uh, been to Rwanda. So we are looking to see how can we, um, despite the fact that we don't have any sort of official um, instruments, how can we, you know, co-finance uh, projects together um, with the various policies that some of the entities have in place. So in Kenya, you've got the Kenya Film Commission. But I think another, I wouldn't call it challenge, but it's just another reality, is that um, there isn't a lot of funding um, in uh, you know, some of the other African countries um, that could, say, match uh, what we have in South Africa, or at least you know, for the filmmakers to, to be able to, to raise finance. Um, we also have um, recently, um, I was at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and one of the instruments that was launched from Durban actually uh, was the um, Africa Continental Free Ta Trade Agreement. Um, you know, from the ICC here in Durban, we had, um, you know, a lot of people from different African countries who are member countries of that uh, trade agreement. And I think the issue you know, for me, for us who are in the cultural industries, is how do we access that? Because it's about opening borders, it's about, uh, you know, uh, lower tra tariffs, making it easier, because it's not easy to co-produce on the continent, you know, just practically, from a practical point of view, but also, um, like I've said, in terms of those, um, those instruments. Um, so going into the future is something that we definitely want to see how we can, how we can grow. Um, I think the NFVF, the National Film and Video Foundation, have really been um, quite consistent in you know, trying to see how do we put these treaties into place. Um, you know, firstly, I think yeah, Nigeria has been one, Kenya is another one that's quite advanced because it does, uh, you know, every, 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 every bit helps. But even you know, despite that, we are looking to see how do we uh, co-produce with um, South Africa, particularly with KZN, like I've mentioned, it's important that um, you know a, a percentage of that uh, budget gets um, utilized in the province. Now, with a co-production, um, we look at your South African component of that. You know, your South African spend. So we're looking for for fifty percent of that South African spend being 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 spent in the province, and then the rest of the budget. Um, you know, uh, can obviously be, be, be spent anywhere. And we're also only looking at the South African component of your, of your budget, not the, not the entire budget. And we're hoping that, um, you know, some of those uh, things will, will, will help, will assist. But our mission, really, um, that we've put, I would say, on ourselves, is how do we better work, um, you know, with our uh, African counterparts in um, producing and developing content. Thank you, Jamie. That's that's really exciting. Um, Jared, you are responsible for directing HHMI Tango Bank Studios' strategic efforts to produce world-class science content and edu educational outreach efforts. What does that look like in terms of the current challenges we are facing in the industry 
Uh, I know Jackie mentioned increasingly, or somebody mentioned increasingly, uh, there's a look on return on investments. Uh, what does that look like uh, from your perspective? So, you know, we're, we're a unique production company, I think, unlike pretty much any in the world in that, um, you know, we have, um, we're mission driven. We are housed within a re science research institute. Um, we see ourselves as a philanthropy. So in many ways, we don't have the challenges that a typical production company is gonna have in terms of ROI. Um, I think we are positioning ourselves and have always positioned ourselves to try to fight for the kinds of films that commissioners may not take when they're looking for the big success. Um, and so I think that's really at the core of our mission. It, it, it becomes challenging because we have to find the right outlets for those, um, but we don't necessarily have the same financial considerations that a production company normally has to keep the lights on. So that's, you know, that presents um, opportunities for us, and through that we try to raise up the, the filmmakers that we're working with, giving them opportunities to get their stories out there um, in a way that starts with the film, because I think that's the other thing that makes us a little bit different, is that we, we see our films as a tool, as a starting point. Um, we want to make these films, we want to get them out there, we want to get them seen, but we want that to be the starting point for the outreach that we can then do around it. Um, the market, I think, you know, we've, we've been around for about 11 years now. Um, we have uh, pretty much spanned the spectrum of platforms. Um, we've done um, feature length uh, films that have made the film festival circuits. We've done IMAX films. We've done one hours for broadcast. We've done short form. And, you know, we're to some extent, uh, to some extent, platform agnostic in that we want to find the right place for the right projects. That said, I think the way the market has been lately, um, you know, we're certainly shifting away from some of the longer form feature length docs because that's a really, really challenging market. You can make the best film in the world, you can win all the prizes at the film festivals and you still can't get distribution for your film. Or if you do get distribution, then it's so tied up in rights that you can't do anything with it. So, you know, I think that's, um, when those films rise to the top and, and, and um, you know, get out there and become a phenomenon, they can do amazing good. But the statistics are not very good for how many of the films that are worthy of that kind of praise actually get it. Um, for us, we are, you know, we're in a transition period right now. We are, um, you know, I've recently taken over as head of the studio. We are shifting more towards short form. Um, because we see that as an opportunity to get, A, to get our material out there much more widely, um, but then also to be able to do a whole lot more with it. So um, I'm gonna talk about Wild Hope a little later on, but I think that's a great example for us of a short form series, it's on YouTube, it's accessible globally for free. Um, we are making those films in a way that the, the, the subjects of the films can actually use those films to help promote their work, which again, that's sort of, quite unusual in, in the broadcast world, in the restrictive licensing world that most people have to, have to fight for. Um, you know, the outreach side of it is really, really important to us. We are, you know, we make our projects to inspire people to understand science better, to understand the natural world better, and then to get active in their own communities, find ways that they can get involved. So that's the lens that we look at to start off. Um, and then we build our projects, uh, both the films and the outreach that goes along with them, towards that goal. Um, you know, Bill was saying earlier that uh, the, the commissioners are looking for successes. And they, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're more risk averse now. I think they've always been risk averse. It's just sort of the nature of it. You see something you like, you want that next one of the same thing. Until someone is brave enough to find something new and then everybody moves in that direction. We are, trying really hard to find ways to get the content out there that doesn't fall into that category. So I'll give you one example. We have a film uh, that aired on PBS Nova a couple of months ago about the race for the new malaria vaccine. And that's a story that we started following with a, with a British production company uh, about three years ago. Um, no commissioners were interested in it. No, you know, no, no broadcast outlets were interested in it. 
but we knew the production team, we knew they really understood science, we knew that this was going to be a well done film if it ever got made. And so we started backing the film at that point to let them get out there and follow the story. You know, it's science. We didn't know that it's vaccine science. We didn't know if it was actually going to work or not, but we knew that if it did, this was going to be a story we wanted to tell. We followed it for a few years. There was huge success. Um, we still, even with the successes there, we still had to fight to find uh, broadcasters who would actually take this, including, you know, some of the top science strands who you would think would be no-brainers to want to air this kind of film because it, it's a transformative vaccine. Um, we did get it on air. We did, now that it aired in the U.S., uh, it's starting to get picked up in other places. But it's a film that no commissioner would have just commissioned outright, um, and it, it never would have gotten made. So I think those are the ones that we want to try to fight for, and we want to try to find those homes, because those are the ones that can truly make a difference. And, um, you know, despite what the industry is doing, um, there are ways to get those stories told. I, you know, I see short form, um, I see social media as a, as a great way to get stories out there. I don't think the finances of it have been figured out yet. Um, you know, I think that's that's where it gets really difficult. Is that how do you, as a filmmaker, make money? You know, make enough money to support your company, to support your life, um, in that space. But I think it will see changes. I think it'll be interesting to do this same panel five years from now and see how it's changed. Because if we had done it five years ago, it would have looked very different. I think that's sort of the nature of our industry, um, to see how it's going to evolve. But I think we're at. You know, it's it's a. It's a scary point right now, but it's also a huge opportunity to help be a part of figuring out how it's going to work next. Yeah, that's a bit scary, but like I say, also very hopeful. Um, okay, and I think I think and 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 any of you guys can can answer this. I think what what is emerging for me is that maybe, and particularly in the room with so many emerging filmmakers and and mid career filmmakers, etc., that targeting. Um, using short form as a means of building up a portfolio, uh, as a means of saying, "Here's my showreel," or "These are the number of films I've made," and this is, you know, establishing a style or something like that. Um, Caitlin, I'll throw it to you because you guys fund a lot of short form. Um, I'll just say that at the end of the day, everyone, and someone said this yesterday in the rate discussion. The only thing at some point that I'm looking at is the quality of the work, right? And and I, again, I, I, again, I'm quoting someone from yesterday. I don't care where you went to school. I don't really care where you live. I don't care what language you're working in. I care about the quality. And we're looking for excellence. And yes, there's a ton of content being made, but really, really good stuff that's got a different point of view, that feels fresh, that feels relevant bring that to us like we are all we're you know we're drowning looking for that and so I think my advice would be just chase that excellence and whatever your brand of it is right and and it doesn't mean you have to you know copy others yes find out what you like try to really articulate why do I like that and what's your version of it but I think at the end of the day we just want excellent exceptional work and then the straight up logistics of it are, and I don't care, you know, everyone said ROI, you know, return on investment, return doesn't have to be financial, right? Like return can be impact, return can be elevating a filmmaker, return can mean different things. It doesn't necessarily have to be like the MBA sense of return on investment, but I want to know that there will be an ROI and I want you to be clear when you're showing me your stuff, like what were you trying to do with this? You know, and, and so if you can articulate that I am exceptional at my craft and here's why I'm doing what I'm doing, you'll be fine. I think where people get lost is when they're trying to copy, when they're trying to produce that volume and they cannot look me eye and tell me what's the story and why am I doing it? So this, I mean, people are gonna roll their eyes because they say this all the time, but like purpose and audience, if you cannot articulate that to me and work at a really high level, then short form, long form, you know, Snapchat, I don't care. Like that to me is irrelevant if, if you need to know these other things. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if you wanna add to maybe that in terms of... Um, I think what Caitlin said is exactly right. You know, it's... There Thank are you, those Bill. 
I mean, you know, I, our stop clock is sort of <laughs> twice that. Uh, but it, it, it's what you just said about what that return on investment on. And I think some of the, the scariness and the spookiness is about the financial stuff. I mean, yeah. a lot of people who are filmmakers, how am I going to make a living at this? And, you know, you look at the, the array of things on social media. There are, there are those platforms that you know, just rely on people just posting it up there. They don't pay for content. There's that, there's noise, but there's the other things I think everybody here who came to this Congress in the room to do is to, to say something. When I was commissioning, what's the first thing I would say to people come in with this grand idea? What are you trying to say? You know, what is it that you're doing? There's plenty of room to do entertainment, but if you want to do something that stands out, that feels different, that's what makes any commissioner stand up and take notice. Well, you know, to Jared's point, people are risk averse. They're looking for something that they don't have to be, that they can trust and they can really, really break through. So my encouragement would be absolutely, do something new, do something unique, do something really interesting, and it will get noticed. And I think that the production value is possible now. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing things now, like how did you do that? You know, the, the film last night, I'm like, how did they make this? <laughs> this is amazing, it's gorgeous, you know? And you hear all the kind of the tools, working with somebody from a fiction background and so forth. And I think that there's a lot of entrepreneurship that could be out there that does it. It's not just about making money or starting a business, it's how do you produce things differently and has those kind of access and that, and that really does stand out. And the industry will kind of level in some ways. And I do think that sometimes uh, the fear that does come from it is looking at just one segment of it. There's so much opportunity. That's why I made the move I did, because I think that there's opportunity to do something that's different, that's empowering, that's meaningful, and th the industry is big enough. Once we figure out the financials of it, everybody's doing trying to figure it out. You know, whether it's short form or, or digital um, and social media. I know at, at PBS, for example, one of the things we really were wrestling with is this you feel really trapped by the format sometimes of hitting in the broadcast hour. It's down to the second. And what, what short form allows you to do is not worry about that. You can have different kinds of lengths and you can make different kinds of stories. And you know, originally when YouTube was starting out and going, everybody said, well, you, three to five minutes is what people watch. And then it crept up to like seven. And as the younger audience came in, they started watching 15 to 20 minutes. So it does evolve and I think that you're gonna get to a spot where not everything has to be you know, 43 minutes and 40 seconds or 59 minutes and 19 seconds, whatever. It's, you can do those sorts of things, so just keep doing it. But what she said is exactly right. Focus on the excellence first. I would just add to that, I agree with that 100%. I think the other, the other key right now, given how tumultuous the industry is, is flexibility as a filmmaker. I think, and Ago's gonna talk to this about this at our session at 11 a little bit more, but um, being able to take a job and make somebody else's film or be a part of somebody else's film or to work for a client and do what they've asked you to do is key because that in many, in many cases will help you pay the bills. Yeah. Then being able to turn around and do your project the way you want to do it you, you need to be able to do both, I think, to survive in this industry. And, um, you know, there's, I, I see a lot of people coming up in this industry. When I started in this industry, I knew nothing. I started at, you know, base level zero. And I learned everything in the industry. Today, I think people come in um, having learned how to shoot and edit since they were like two years old and can do things that I will never know how to do. But I think what often happens is they have those skills, but they haven't really learned how to tell story yet. And I think so, you know, that side of it is, is worth the investment. I mean, that's what, why we're involved in programs like NUF, because you guys are teaching that side of it along with all the other skills so that, uh, you know, you come through these programs, you have all the skills to make your own film in the way you want to make it. You also have the skills to get a job and the, and the, and the equipment in many cases to, to, to get a job and pay the bills. Um, last night's film, Tyra's film, I mean, I think that's such a great example. That's a film she, that was her vision and she put that film together and it took a long time and she did it, but she was, because she wasn't making it for a commissioner, she could make the film she wanted to make. Yeah. Um, and now we're all out there, we get to benefit from that, we get to see her vision. And I think that is where you wanna get to, but you also have to be able to do the other stuff in order to try to make a career out of, career out of it, especially when things are so, um, so crazy right now in the industry. Absolutely. Jackie, just to maybe, End, end with you and I think we, we only, you know, we can go on and on and, and, and these are some real nuggets. But what we can do is there's no, we're not going to do any questions. On swap card, I believe, um, you can post uh, any questions that you have and Marsha will see to it that we get them in front of, of, of everybody up here to, 
to, to answer some of the questions that you might have. So please go there, to, please go to Swapcard and, 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 and put in any questions that you might have. But you, know, you said, and I'm very excited to hear that the threshold has dropped to 50%. Um, that, that used to be 75, I think, right? Um, so it's dropped down to 50. And I'm just thinking there's a, there's a film um, that Jamila um, is doing in collaboration with uh, a fellow in Kenya, and they're also shooting in Mozambique. Um, but, you know, so with a project like that, she could come and apply for the budget or apply for some of the budget and shoot and that would qualify even though let's say 50% of the film is being shot in Mozambique and Kenya. Yeah. And this is 50% of the South African component. So the Mozambican and Kenyan we don't, um, we don't, we, we don't look at. So what, what I'm saying is that your total budget includes your South African, Mozambican and Kenyan component. We only look at the 50% of the South African component, not the entire oh, um, okay. budget. So hopefully that also that that also helps. Um, but yes, I mean let's 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 have the conversation. We're really um, hungry for these for these for these types of projects. It's just a quick thing that I wanted to say about um, short films, particularly with the emerging filmmakers. You know, we we obviously deal with the emerging filmmakers. Um, most of our, our funding applicants. Um, you know, quite often we get applications from new emerging filmmakers and they want to make these big feature, you know, film documentaries and so on. And we always encourage that start with a short film. You know, make the best film you can. That will hopefully travel. It becomes then your calling card. You know, make one, make a few. Um, send them out. We are very big on mentoring. You know, we'll match you with um, somebody who's experienced who will um, assist you to deliver that film. But start with a short and um, and wait, work work your way from there. Thanks. And let's have a discussion about co-producing with Africa. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, let's give everybody a good a good round of applause. Thank you. And we finished on time. Can you believe it? Guys, thank you so much. Uh, this was really helpful. I even put on a suit for you guys this morning. Um. <laughs> yes, Sing. thank you so much, Noel, for finishing on time. Um, so we're going to have a 15-minute break, and we have conservation action coming up. Wambui and Ariel will be leading that session. Um, so feel free to take a break, stretch your legs and quickly rush back for 10.15 for the next session.
also just a reminder to return crockery and cutlery that you come in with from the breaks. There's a phrase in South Africa I love, walala wasala, means basically you snooze, you lose. So everyone who isn't here yet is missing out. Um, we'll have Wambui and Ariel take us through the next session. Hello. All right, I hope everyone has had a warm cup of tea. I've had some complaints that the room is too cold, but. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Welcome to the conservation action session. Uh, introducing the African Conservation Voices uh, Fellowship Fellows. Uh, so the African Conservation Voices is pretty special to me and I'll tell you why. So, the year is 2022, sometime in July. And a bunch of us, of what, who we call African Conservation Voices Fellows, have just arrived in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, uh, for APAC, that is the African Protected Areas Congress. And so we've literally just landed. We've been taken to the cocktail party that's happening somewhere at a rooftop bar. Uh, and uh, we are new. It's the first time we've just made a film. It's going to showcase for the first time. I don't know about the rest, but I know I looked like a deer in headlights. You know, so, so we are standing there and I'm talking to a bunch of our mentors. And then I see one of the mentors just beckoning to someone to come over and meet us and in saunters this guy, and he's like, oh, hi, I've seen all your work. Oh my God, your films are amazing. And you know what? Next year, you have to come to Durban. Come for the summit, and you know, if you all don't know by now, this person <laughs> is Noel Cook. And I'm, I'm standing there and I'm looking, and I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, and where is he getting all this energy? And just like that, uh, African Conservation Voices Fellows, who we were the first bunch of fellows, we had just met Newf, and that was the beginning of a really, really beautiful uh, relationship. And I think what that did for us, it was the first time that for us who were working in conservation and in filmmaking in East Africa, at least for me, it was the first time I got the opportunity to have this really 
Pan-African connection, just standing there and talking to people from Rwanda, from South Africa, from all these other countries, and this is important, and this is the, the basis and the reason of why these fellowships are formed. But Ariel, um, this first iteration of the African Conservation Voices is a, very, is, is, is a little bit different from what we have now. Do you want to talk us through why you felt the need to pivot from the short-term form of, of lab to this long-term fellowship format? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, my name is Ariel Rokunga. I work for the African Wildlife Foundation. I lead the storytelling there. And as she said, we we came up with the Africa Conservation Voices program in partnership with Jackson Wild and Rachel and some of you were uh, part of the first cohort. By the way, nobody call me Rachel. I'm one sorry. boy. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm very <laughs> sorry. Very sorry, one boy. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So we, as part of the first cohort, we... We did the trainings, as you said. It was a much different um, format, a different program, and we were kind of figuring things out as we went along the way. And one of the things that we realized really quickly was that the film output was not necessarily beneficial for all the storytellers who we had brought on board initially. And so as we were trying to chart our way forward, we felt that that was one thing that we needed to change. And then the other thing was, it was very clear to us that we could not do it by ourselves. Um, you know, and through the, the partnerships that were starting to form in spaces that we convened, like you said, meeting with uh, Noel and Pragna, we realized that it's, it would be better and easier if we had people who had made um, fellowship their business and then brought in the conservation aspect because um, that's something that we, we think is very important. And I guess we'll go into that a bit later. And I think essentially that also leads up to the importance of collaborations, as Dr. Willie was talking about. There are things that we, as a storytelling organization, are able to do as far as impact is in conservation is, con is concerned, but also there are things that AWF, as a conservation organization, can do that we necessarily can do. So that's the value of coming together and uh, pretty much leveraging on the impact of both, right? Uh, and Absolutely. I've just gotten word that we should move to the upper stage. Is that what control wants us to do? <laughs> uh, I don't know why I thought that was a much easier. Does that mean we should sit? <laughs> All right, uh, so during last year's uh, summit and Congress, we had an announcement of what this new um, fellowship was going to look like uh, in terms of announcing the collaboration between AWF uh, and NUV. Uh, we've had a really solid relationship with, with AWF. I think a lot of our fellows, uh, I am going to be brave enough to say are absolutely in love with Cardu uh, Sebunya, the AWF uh, CEO, who um, informs a lot of, of the values that we, 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 we uh, the values are pr very much aligned with what NUF is as well as a storytelling organization. Um, uh, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about the thinking of how you, you wanted the call out to look like? What was the intention of the impact with uh, the kind of fellows we were looking for for this fellowship? Okay, I think for us the first thing was that we needed to be able to use the films to convene around certain issues. Uh, like you said, we're a conservation organization. There's, uh, and I think we have a unique philosophy. Um, for us, we believe that if you care for the wildlife, um, then you must care for the lands that the wildlife exist in. 
and you must recognize that people also live in those lands. And if you care about the people and the wildlife, then you must care about the laws that govern the people and the wildlife. And so for us, we've broken it down into those three things, that we help to lead for wildlife, we help to help and, yeah, we help people live with wildlife and we care for wildlife. So as we go through those three things, we've seen that film is an easy way to get the leaders, the policy makers, to start to care about what is happening in uh, one with the wildlife and with the people who live in those areas. So this really is, is a tool for us to convene. And I just take it back to the story that you shared about how you met um, Uncle Noel. Um, we brought together African Protected Area Directors at APAC to discuss um, issues, Africa Protected Area Conservation, and through that, this partnership was formed. Because of that convening opportunity and the films that we came together with, this came up. So for us, it's really just one of the easiest tools to help convene. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things I, 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 that really gets me excited about how we've begun this fellowship is that we've structured it around principles, so to speak, so that as the fellows are going ahead in telling their stories, they are being guided by these very basic principles of prioritizing communities that live uh, with and around wildlife, and also obviously shifting the narrative about about conservation. So we are, we are absolutely not shy to say that we have a very pan-African agenda uh, with this with this particular fellowship. Without further ado. Uh, we did uh, put out the call out, we got a lot of interesting uh, applications and one of the most interesting thing is that what these call outs were open to ACV fellows, obviously to new fellows and to National Ge Geographic explorers and one of the most exciting things for us is to, we've, we've had this, this shift where we, uh, we had National Geogra Geographic Explorers now becoming new fellows, and it's just sort of uh, amplifying this idea of this cross-pollination of this storytelling community. So that has been an exciting uh, thing, thing for us. Eri, do you want to talk to us about a little bit of the experience of uh, the selection process? What was that like for you? Well, um I mean, of course, some really great uh, submissions came in. Um, some guys were jokers. There's someone who said that his synopsis would follow soon after the application. Um, yeah, I mean, if it was a comical uh, fellowship, that probably would have been one of the guys you'd have looked to. But uh, I think it was just beautiful seeing the, the range, um, the topics, and I think, I think I was mentioning this to you um, late last night, is that it's interesting to see that we are more similar than we are different. Because even though these stories are coming from across the continent, it's very easy to pick um, similarities. Yeah. And I think for me, one of the most interesting things as well is that in terms of the range of applications we got, I think some people even f uh, pitched fiction <laughs> some fiction stories, and some of them are pretty good, actually. I was like, hmm, maybe we could consider this. Uh, and so it was just interesting to see the range of, of ideas coming across the continent, and even though most of these stories didn't make it because we had to cut it down to 10, to 10 applicants, uh, we did make a decision that that a lot of those, some of those applications would be uh, pushed forward to other similar fellowships and labs within new. So every, all is not lost. It's always good to be having um, these ideas coming to us and finding ways where we can make a lot of those projects work. All this to say that there's a lot of good ideas uh, coming from from the community uh, around the continent. So uh, we did finally get down to our 10, and I think the main purpose of this session is to introduce those 10. Uh, it was a long process, it was absolutely competitive, 
and uh, today you're going to meet uh, the, t the nine out of the ten fellows who made it uh, to, to, to who are going to be part of to be forming part of that of that cohort. Uh, and um, so the first person I think will be. I think we can run the slide and see who the first fellow who's going to come up on stage and introduce themselves to us, tell us what their story is about and what motivated them to be working on this particular story. And while we are waiting for that slide, oh, there we go. Aika, Miss Aika Kray. It's so good to see you here. I am so excited to be a part of the ACVPL, the African Conservation Voices Producers Lab. Um, my story, as you see, is about resilience, community resilience. Resilience is such a powerful word to me. It um, it's holds so much and it speaks to the inner optimist in me. Um, resilience and, of course, breakfast is another powerful word to me, but we're talking about resilience today. Mm -hmm. um, it's the ability to withstand and to adapt and to bounce back from adversity. My story looks at a community and people in Morogoro who are fighting to preserve the landscape of Kilombero Valley. That landscape is being decimated by the de deforestation that is happening at such an alarming rate due to the rapidly expanding farming of sugar and um, rice farming. So this group, led by a really um, amazing guy called Arafat Ntui, is working with local communities to reforest the area using native trees. But there's a catch, the government policy, which requires any harvesting of local trees to have uh, special permits and to also uh, be paid for. So the people receive these seeds of native, plant, native trees to plant them, but they have to pay to do any sort of harvesting. So there's that challenge and that friction that's going on over there. Um, the story is about uh, community taking action, agency, which speaks so deeply to me, and I hope it inspires all everybody who eventually comes to see it. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person is... Anthony Ocheng, Kenya. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those who know me, pretty know me much as a photographer, and I'll want to tell this story in a different way. You guys have a phone? Right, can you just jump to Instagram? and then look for that name. <laughs> I've just pinned, and the followers can actually just check. <laughs> you guys have found it? What do you guys see? It's someone fishing, and behind is bulls of elephants enjoying their feel. This is in Lake Jipe, at the southern edge of Kenya in Savo National Park, where a fisherman community are actually living together with, with elephants in harmony. It's not, it's not that beauty that we see mostly in people living with elephants, because it's always been, in most cases, conflicts uh, between elephants and, and human communities. My first experience of human wildlife conflict was uh, in my second year of high school, when I was pretty much told by my dad not to go fishing. But that night I decided to go fishing and I was chased by a hippo. And that was the last time I tried fishing business. But then seeing these fishermen just spending time together with these elephants in one particular space. And you, when you ask them, and one of them, and I quote, these are like our brothers. And we are happy to always see them here. 
But this community has actually developed a resilience where they can't actually be able to do crop farming. So they have to just survive with doing uh, any other type of business to survive, to survive together with, this, with these elephants. It's interesting that it not just affects the men, it affects the women, it also affects the children. The children know when the time of this particular elephant, led by Manolo, Manolo is a bull, that they just reside in that particular area and they move uh, from, from the highlands into the lake. And this lake is more of like a, a reserve place where they, all of us meet, the fishermen and the, and the women and the elephants, and they share this resource especially even during drought, they can able to survive. So my story builds up on, on just sharing how interesting this particular community has found a way to actually be able to live in with elephants' resilience. To the extent they know their daily routines, they know who's, which elephant is actually a stubborn one, like they've studied them longer, and that is information they've actually kept to heart. And I felt coming from doing a photo assignment for this particular story, a film will be a much more powerful way to share that interesting story. And I hope to share it with you guys soon. Thank you. Amazing. Um, next we have Shumo. Shumo Trash from Cameroon. Hello, Nuf. Hello, Africa. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, being my first time here in Durban and being my first time to uh, attend uh, the Congress and Fellow Summit. Um, my story is basically about um, the plight of elephants in the Kampuman National Park in Cameroon. This park uh, from uh, the Congo Basin Forest and for some reason, there has been the creation of agro uh, plantations, and the agro plantation is chopping into the habitat of these elephants. As a result of this, um, there has been recurrent elephant-human uh, conflict, uh, which has been degenerating. So my story will kind of inspire conservation organization uh, individuals to take action to um, uh, stop or reduce this conflict between elephants and humans. Uh, I happen to come from an area whereby uh, last year in 2022, uh, that is Boya, it's a beautiful town and I would encourage everyone to visit it. And <coughs> an elephant happened to have killed uh, one individual uh, in an area, so um, I was so touched and I feel that I can let the world know what is happening uh, in Cameroon and of course uh, attract a lot of conservation organizations to take action to uh, mitigate this conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shimo. <laughs> Mr. Adams Kasinga. Good day, everyone. Uh, it's such a beautiful thing to be here. So I'm going to go straight to, to the point. In uh, preserving our natural heritage and the biodiversity of the Congo Basin Forest, I, Adam Skasinga, a wildlife criminal investigator and activist from the DRC. I am addressing a critical challenge faced by the Billy Uwere community. And uh, the challenge implicates uh, the industrial poaching of bushmeat. And this impacts the environment in a very negative way. Now, there is an urgent need for change which emanates from the realization that a shift from awareness strategy from a traditional NGO uh, policy to community-centric understanding 
is very paramount. The solution lies in putting a human being at the core of conservation, advocating for alternative means of survival for the people, at the same time enforcing wildlife laws. And this way, we shall ensure a very sustainable of bushmeat consumption and that there is future for the Congo Basin Forest. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Gamid, Tanzania. Hello, everybody. Oh, well, that's a good smile, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, it's an honor to be here and part of the fellows as well. So Tanzania uh, is holding and we're actually custodians of 30% of the global freshwater reserve. I don't know if you guys knew about that. Now, um, we all understand that uh, with the impacts of climate change, so I decided uh, my work to be centered around the nexus between science and policy, especially in the biodiversity arena. Water insecurity in terms of quality and quantity and scarcity in my country, of course, has been an alarming challenge and, of course, exacerbated by the policies and, of course, um, the, um, uh, the engineering solutions that have been much more upfront, more than nature-based solutions. They also say that the Third World War is going to be on fresh water. Now, imagine that war happening in my own country. It's going to be a disaster, right? So what I decided to is to come up with a film on waves of Kilombero. Everybody say waves. 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 So basically, these are the freshwater waves about the Kilombero Valley. And the aim is to put human at the center of the solutions, bringing about um, a character who happens to be my classmate um, based in the Kilombero. And I'll be your beautiful science reporter in that film. And the aim is to uh, showcase human at the heart of the water solutions along the Kilombero Valley, the vision of eco-hydrology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gamid. Gamid has decided we've been very ocean-centric, and he's taking us inland. Well done. Um, Kudz and I. Hello everyone, well, I'm working a film that is done in Imbire community, a community which is in the middle of the mid Zambezi Valley uh, conservation area in Zimbabwe. This is an area with high biodiversity and unique species in it. I will be looking at how co human and wildlife conflicts influences the poisoning of vultures. I want to do this film because I love my community and I love vultures. Thank you, Kudz and I. Keeping it short and sweet, I guess we'll have to wait and watch the film when it showcases next year. Um, next we have Benjamin Owar, Kenya. <laughs> Good morning. How are you guys? Great. So, like you, I have been inspired by the stories around me. The stories I heard from my parents, my grandparents, and just the people around. As Africans, our ways of living, our ways of conservation were passed down through these stories. And there's one that found me in the Savo region. My film, Rajasha, Gift of the Hunt, focuses on the bushmeat trade in the Savo region. But more so, it focuses on indigenous science and coexistence with nature. I can't wait to show it to you guys. 
thank you, Benjamin. And finally, Mr. Prashant Mohesh. Hello everyone, how are you all doing today? Amazing, I think I'm um, the first fellow from Mauritius, if I'm not mistaken here. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, some of you have seen some of my stories, I've been with Shami in Mauritius, diving with sperm whales, so, oops. A little bit about myself, I'm a scuba diver, and uh, how do I start my country? It's a bit in your, it's a bit uh, underrepresented in Africa, but we have such a beautiful biodiversity. So, without further ado, my story is about the gentle giants of the ocean, the sperm whales. So, in this story, I'm going to be highlighting the biodiversity in the deep, and also why is it important to have sperm whales in, this, uh, in our ecosystem, their challenges, and also their, the way of living. We have not, some of you have not seen sperm whales sleeping, but Shami and I have seen it. We have seen sperm whales playing with us on the boat, and then 10 minutes later, you just go to sleep. So that was amazing. So it would be an amazing story highlighting the importance of sperm whales in our ecosystem, and also Highlighting that, they are resident in Mauritius. So they are all around the island, especially on the west coast. There have been a lot of challenges, many, many, many challenges, and uh, it's uh, very important to bring justice to these deep diving giants. And also part of my work with National Geographic focuses on ocean conservation, and I use the power of storytelling to bring justice to these ocean creatures. And that's it about me. Thank you, Prashant. Um, a little bit about that. So when we were looking at these uh, applications, there was a focus on certain areas. And definitely, the ocean was not a part of the focus areas. But when we saw Prashant's uh, application and pitch, we absolutely fell in love with his story. And it just had to be. Uh, part of the fellowship. All that to say that pitches matter. The way you pitch your story matters. So get to those pitching workshops, please. Um, so there's one more person. Uh, Sama? I did not forget you, Sama. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, the last year summit when the LZVPR fellowship was announced, I was not here, and luckily I'm here as one of the fellows. So it's, it's huge for me. I am a filmmaker and a social worker in the aspect of humanitarian peace and inclusion. To me, an inclusive society is not just about women. It's about women. That is the interconnection between women, wildlife, nature, and the environment. So my film uh, work, my work is going to be based in the Kampumai region in the south region of Cameroon. This uh, project is going to focus on the indigenous Pikmi community in the south region based in this Kampumai region. These indigenous people were semi-nomadic and uh, settled in the Campo mine region, and they were engaged in poaching and game hunting as a source of livelihood. But now, they are engaged in conservation by engaging in housing system and agricultural practices that promote conservation. And also, my project is going to highlight the human-wildlife interaction and the conflict in this region. 
it is very important for me to tell this story because um, there's a conflict in this region between the government and the indigenous people over land use. So I wish the government and people to understand the role of indigenous people in conservation and also uh, people to understand that we can all, all coexist, whether you're women, whether it is wildlife, whether it is nature or it is environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mildred. Uh, so, Ariel, do you want to tell us, uh, having gotten the breadth of, um, of, of the stories that we have, uh, AWF as an organization, how are you feeling about the kind of impact that these kind of stories would have? I mean, we're extremely excited. Um, just the type of representation that we have across the continent, like you said, um, we are more a terrestrial conservation organization, but the fact that um, the, the sperm whale story really um, came up in uh, the applications, I mean, there's some stories that you can't, you just can't not tell. Um, and for us, maybe just to give a bit of context, the, um, the themes that kind of came up, the human wildlife conflict, the community resilience, the role of uh, indigenous people and local communities and conservation, those are themes that are very important to us and they fit into the three uh, pillars that I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, just how, how do we negotiate space, you know, between the people and the animals, how do we uh, bring up a value proposition um, for the people living in those areas um, to conserve the species that we have, um, how how do we develop and conserve Africa at the same time? And those are really difficult um, things to address without living examples from probably another region. And I mean, we're just really excited to see what will come of this. Absolutely, and I think the only thing left to do now is to actually make the films. Um, and it, it's a really good place to end by uh, quoting one of the things that, that Kadu, the CEO of AWF, says. I mean, for us, uh, a, a, as a storytelling organization, it's, you know, conservation is a, is a really big pillar of what we do because we want to get to a place where we're giving uh, uh, storytellers the kind of, of, of uh, ability to have the, the, the narrative, uh, the conservation narrative. Uh, but I believe Kadu puts it very well when he says, for conservation to succeed in Africa, it must be seen as, a, as relevant to African people. We know the most powerful way to bring conservation into public consciousness is in Africa is by empowering Africans to tell and share our stories. And I would say essentially that is the guiding principle of what African Conservation Voices, as it says in the name, is all about. Right? That's true. I can't, I can't say anything after that, otherwise I might not have my job tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, folks, other than be here next year to see the films where they will showcase. Um, and that's it for, from us. Let's hear a round of applause for the fellows. That's right. That's right. A round of applause for the fellows indeed. Uh, I'm not going to lie, when Pata Pata started playing, we were really getting into it. But unfortunately, it cut out just when she starts singing. Um, so during the break, you can feel free to listen to Pata Pata. We have a break, but at 11.30 sharp, we'll be back in here for the next session with Wild Hope. Um, yes, please remember crockery, cutlery. We bring it in, we take it back. Thank you so much.
<laughs> How many Kenyans in the house? Yeah, now you're getting there, you see? I need to warm you all up. Ah, ah, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. What nonsense is this? <laughs> Mozambique! <laughs> Oh, Kenyans, you've got some competition for a change. Cameroon! Nah, nah, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Go back and recruit. Go back and look for more fellows. Mauritius! Uh, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Huh? Come on. Hey, what is that? Tanzania! Uh -uh. South Africa! <laughs> okay, so when you'll see, when you'll hear us saying that most of our fellows come from Kenya, we mean it. You can hear by the noise, okay? <laughs> you, how, how much? <laughs> okay, should we call Madagascar? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love that. <laughs> well done. Um, if you thought I'm, you know, being nice, I'm just I'm just buying time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, on a serious note, uh, Prags, are we ready for the second winner? Okay, so remember earlier we, we spoke about the fact that we had the Science Film Fellowship and that we asked you guys to vote and we played the third placed film. And just to remind you all that this is a Science Film Fellowship that we did all of last year. It's part of our strategy of trying to change the narrative um, of, you know, s so that, um, you know, we want to highlight um, that you don't only, when you're telling stories about Africa, you don't only show us as poachers and pirates and rangers and guides. We love our rangers and guides. Please make no mistake about that. Okay, but we are so much more than that. And there are so many unbelievably passionate, talented, young scientists across Africa. Uh, and as filmmakers, please make an extra effort to showcase them, etc. And so, the votes are in, and this is the film that plays second. Enjoy. Os animais noturnos são muitas vezes associados com aspectos negativos o que contribui bastante para que eles sejam mal interpretados. Os morcegos, infelizmente, fazem parte destes animais. Isso faz com que muitas pessoas tenham repulsa pelos mesmos, ainda que os morcegos sejam animais inofensivos. E eu entendo isso porque já estive nessa situação. O meu primeiro contato com morcegos foi interessante porque foi a primeira vez que eu vi um morcego pequenino, tão fofinho, só por ver ele ali na mão da pesquisadora com quem estávamos, ah, já foi bem interessante. Não diria amor à primeira vista, mas a partir dali já foi um sentimento no sentido, hum, que tal estudar essas criaturas? Tal como nós, os morcegos são mamíferos muito inteligentes e que vivem por muito tempo. E a maioria das espécies são sociais 
e vivem em grandes comunidades chamadas colônias. Cada espécie tem uma linguagem diferente e complexa que lhes permite comunicar entre si. Mas estes sons estão acima do nosso alcance auditivo, o que faz com que não consigamos ouvi-los. Os morcegos produzem sons relacionados ao cortejamento e ao casamento, à defesa do território, à coesão do grupo e muitos outros comportamentos. Então, daí o interesse em estudar como é este comportamento acústico nas espécies que nós temos em Gorongosa. Infelizmente, tenho de esconder dos morcegos a minha beleza. Eu observo o comportamento, faço vídeo do que eles estão a fazer, gravo os seus sons e tenho que sincronizar as imagens e os sons para poder explicar que aquele som que é emitido naquele momento corresponde ao comportamento X. Depois de passar os sons para o computador para poder escutar, é sempre tudo uma novidade. A questão é sempre o que será que eu vou encontrar desta vez. O limite máximo da capacidade auditiva humana é de 20 kHz. Acima disso, nós temos ultrações e os morcegos produzem ultrações para poder comunicar-se. Por isso, eu preciso usar gravadores e softwares adequados que me permitem escutar as sessões e poder estudá-los. Este é um dos sons que eles emitem quando são agressivos um com o outro. Temos aqui no vídeo um macho e uma fêmea. O som emitido durante a interação é este. E a princípio eu considero um canto de cortejamento. Para a maior parte das espécies africanas, nós ainda precisamos conhecer melhor a sua biologia, bem como a sua ecologia. Então, é extremamente interessante poder parar e observar os morcegos. E uma das coisas mais interessantes que eu uh, tive a oportunidade de ver foi o que é descrito como comportamento de cortejamento e acasalamento. E quando eles estão ali, aparentemente, acasalados, é... <risos> é tão... Ai, é tão bonito, é tão... Ai, só vendo. A minha pesquisa vai ajudar a criar a primeira base de dados de vocalizações sociais de morcegos no meu país, que é uma espécie de dicionário de morcegos. Ser uma jovem cientista norte-americana é desafiador, é interessante, porque Moçambique é um campo fértil para a ciência. Há muita coisa que nós podemos ainda investigar 
são muito gratos. Há muitos cientistas estrangeiros que vêm cá pesquisar, que nos mostram que há muita coisa que nós podemos informar ao mundo uh, sobre as nossas espécies, os nossos ecossistemas. Mas será ainda mais interessante quando nós mesmos, moçambicanos, formos os principais protagonistas desta, desta produção de conhecimento. Yeah. So the filmmaker, Algo, where are you? The filmmaker is Algo, and Cesario is the scientist. Cesario. <laughs> Round of applause. Have I guess? No, I have to mention Mua. Mua, I never knew, and Labdi, I never knew when we started this composer's thing that you guys would be making courtship songs for bats. You know, this is like taking composition to a whole nother level. But anyway, yeah, we could borrow that somewhere, I guess. Uh, well done, guys. Um, Cesario, I've never heard anybody explaining courtship like that either. You know, so cute. <laughs> I mean, all right. <laughs> um, guess that's science, right? That's how we're trying to change the narrative, right? We want to make science interesting. And, yeah, well, I guess if you put sex into anything, it's going to be interesting. Okay? These, those stories seem to work all the time. So, um, don't forget, after lunch, just before the start of that session, we will play the winning theme. Okay? Um, I'm really excited to introduce this next session, okay? It's called Meet Wild Hope. Because so much of what we do is about giving hope. And I really like this idea of creating wild hope. You know, if it's gonna be hope, let it be wild, you know what I'm saying? Okay? And so without any further ado, let's put your hands together for Jared Lipworth, Jeff Luck, and Augusto Vila. Yeah. Okay, I think we're waiting for our slide deck, but it'll it'll come up and we can get started without it in the meantime. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a great uh, to follow up on this morning session to be able to talk a little bit more in detail about Wild Hope. Um, as I mentioned this morning, Tangle Bank Studios is a production company uh, that is mission driven to tell stories that help people understand and get comfortable with science, to inspire people to want to learn more, um, and to um, create an environment where learning can happen with entertainment. Um, so all of our films are designed to be, um, ah, here we go, okay. Um, we'll start with one of my favorite quotes, which you know, to me this has kind of been my philosophy of filmmaking since the very beginning. Um, if you tell a good story, you can sneak a whole lot of information in when no one's looking. So um, you know, that's been my goal my whole career, that's what our goal is at Tangled Bank to really try to tell stories that inspire and, uh, ooh, the one thing I forgot to get was the clicker, huh? There we go. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> so, you know, that's been our mission, to promote stories that uh, create uh, public, greater public understanding of science, um, to help people understand that science and scientists are, you know, that scientists are everyday people who, um, you know, have emotions and who are doing work that they're very passionate about and work very hard at. Um, we use our films, as I mentioned before, I see our films as a tool. We use our films to, uh, as a starting point for conversation, a starting point for activation, to get people to get more comfortable with science, to, uh, you know, to 
make a difference in their own communities, find ways that they can either get involved or at least be a little bit more informed. Um, we work really hard to focus on process. That's something that in a lot of other science films that I've seen, uh, process gets overlooked. Um, but helping people understand and get more familiar with that scientific process and with what goes into the, you know, the context of scientific discoveries is really important to us. Um, and of course, to inspire wonder and curiosity, um, you know, that's the big thing. I look back at my career, um, I was inspired by Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, by National Geographic World Magazine, uh, the kids' magazine, and those made a difference for me. Um, and I'm one individual person, but whenever I, we, we put out a new film or a new project, I always think to myself, are we going to inspire one person? And if so, then that film, to me, was worth it. And so I think what we're trying to do is find ways to show people themselves in the scientists that we feature, to show people how science changes the world, and to really get them inspired to, um, you know, to understand and to pursue. Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, we are moving more and more into short form, and our biggest foray into short form has been Wild Hope. Um, this is some, uh, this is uh, U.S., num well, worldwide and U.S. numbers, but just to give you a sense of why we think short form has so much potential. 2.7 billion active users on YouTube. Um, users watch 1 billion hours of video each day. I can tell you I've got, uh, I've got kids who are uh, 10 and 13, and when you say watch YouTube, it's not watch one video. It's watch one video, which leads to the next. Um, at its worst, we call that doom scrolling. Um, we're trying to turn it into hope scro scrolling. We're trying to say, all right, you're going to watch it, you're going to get sucked in, but let's get you sucked in with good content that's actually going to, uh, you know, feed your mind rather than kill it. Um, so, you know, a few more numbers just show how much opportunity there is in this space. So Wild Hope, um, you know, that's, that was our biggest foray into, uh, into short form. And we started out um, with well, it's based on a book. There's a book by Andrew Bomford called Wild Hope, where he went around the world looking at different examples of um, conservation success stories. Really wide range of examples. Um, there was one story that was uh, actually from South Africa. Um, and we read this book and we thought to ourselves, you know what, this would make a perfect series. Um, so often with a series, it's really easy to figure out what is your first episode, what is your third episode. But the, it gets harder when you think about what is your 13th or your 30th episode. And with Wild Hope, we started doing the research. And our initial list, I think we had 150 or 189 stories that were potentials. Um, we decided with our first, uh, with the first, se this first season of Wild Hope. Oh. I'm frozen here. There we go. Uh, so the first season we did is half hours. We wanted to make sure that as we were launching this new series, we would give it an opportunity to get out on broadcast in a, uh, you know, at a length that was feasible. Um, so we made eight half hour episodes. Um, we, they went out on PBS um, uh, broadcast on the pbs.org app. And then we also partnered up with PBS Nature to put them out on their YouTube uh, channel. And that's really where we see the, uh, the future of the series is on YouTube. Um, in season two, we decided, you know, we, because we didn't have that requirement of a half hour to meet a broadcast length, we decided we really wanted these stories to be the length that they should be. Um, initially, we conceived of season two as being 12 five-minute episodes, 12 12 to 15 minute episodes. Um, we have yet to come close to a five minute episode. Uh, in fact, all 24 of them will ultimately be, I think the shortest is about seven, the longest is about 18. And we just found that that was really a sweet spot to be able to tell the stories at a depth that made sense, that a depth that could show more than just a news piece and really start to get into the characters of the piece. Um, so season two, 24 of those, we've got I think eight or nine that are out already and the rest are coming out over the next few months. Um, we also started, so, so, so the film, and then we're working on season three, uh, just getting started with development on that right now. Um, from the beginning, Wild Hope was conceived not as a series but as a movement. Um, and again, I, I know I keep saying this, but the films were a tool to start to get to people, to get, help people understand that all is not lost, that conservation is happening all over the world successfully, and that everybody can play their part. 
So um, in addition to the YouTube and the, and the broadcast, we also created an Instagram channel. Um, we are, um, so the broadcast, the, sorry, the YouTube numbers, I think uh, about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we hit one million viewers on YouTube. Um, what was nice about YouTube is that we partnered, by partnering with Nature, we were building into, we were putting our content into an already existent audience. They have about, uh, I think it's about 800,000 followers. And so the numbers went up quite quickly. What, we, what was great to see is that as we, each new episode came out, we saw great numbers on that episode. We also see, saw a rise in the, in the previous episodes. So to us, that's a way of indicating, yeah, you know, this is actually working. People are watching this film and then going on to some of the others. Um, Instagram, we started from scratch. Um, and uh, I've got a little call to action for this room because I checked the numbers just before we, uh, we came out here. And we're at 19,900 Instagram users. Um, this was from a site that started in July. So I would welcome you guys to, uh, to follow us on Instagram. I think we can hit 20,000 while we're here, which would, be, which would be nice. And, you know, I think I find it very cynical to kind of play to the algorithms, but I also recognize that when you are in this space, you kind of have to because the, more you, the better your numbers are, the more people are seeing your content. And so it's that back and forth. We want to create good content. We want to create content that is, um, that is that works for people where they are on the platforms they're at, so that we can um, we can then get them to see it and and be engaged with it and and not doom scroll but hope scroll. Um, so as I said, it's a movement. So the Instagram site, it's the videos are up there. We did these reels, and we'll show you one in a minute um, that are 90 second reels. There's a whole bunch of other content. Uh, Wildhope.tv is our website. That's kind of the hub where we have. Uh, the opportunity to dig a whole lot deeper into the content. So the films are there. You can find out profiles on the, on the participants in the films. You can find out more about the topics. Um, you can get directed to other content that's related. Um, you know, that's a place where we want to make it, try to make it choose your own adventure. Um, so if you're there and you just want to watch videos, great, keep watching the videos. If there's a particular topic, you know, axolotls, we did a film on axolotls in our first season. Axolotls seem to be, um, I don't know, people just smile when they see them. And so, you know, if you want to learn more about axolotls, you can do that from the site. Um, so it's designed to be a place where you can dig as deep as you want to dig, or you can just browse. Um, but we also recognize that in, on every platform, you have to create content assuming that that's the only content they're going to see. So um, the YouTube videos, if you just watch those, you're going to come away with an experience. You're going to, I think, get out of Wild Hope what we want you to get out of it. Um, the reels were an interesting challenge. For those, we were looking at them and thinking, all right, well, we made them, they're derivative of the longer pieces, but we wanted them to stand alone. We didn't want them to be a sizzle or a promotion for the longer piece. We wanted them to be their own experience. So that if you're there, if that's all you see, great. You're going to walk away with understanding what we're trying to do with Wild Hope. Um, there's other content we do. We worked with a company, uh, there's this amazing animation company called Peppermint Narwhal, who does a lot of, uh, of conservation uh, animation. They, we did a series with them that's rolling out on Instagram now and on the website that is about um, sort of historical conservation success stories. So things like the bald eagle, where we may not want to go out and tell that story because that's quite an old, quite, quite a well-known story, but in a three-part um, slideshow, we can create an animation that is going to help people understand that story and put it into the context of the Wild Hope universe. Um, let's just see here. So when it comes to the stories, you know, there's a lot of conservation happening. There's a lot of natural history work that's being done there. But we were really trying to make sure with all our stories that we were looking at it through a Wild Hope lens. So what does that mean to have a Wild Hope lens? It means that we want to find the intrepid change makers. We want to find people who are thinking outside the box, who are looking at things in a different way, who are not waiting around for corporations or governments to make change, but are doing it themselves. Um, and we'll, we'll talk through some examples of, of each of these uh, in a couple of minutes. We wanted to showcase innovative thinking, unexpected alliances. That was a big one for us. Um, finding partners that, were, that you wouldn't expect were necessarily going to either work together or care about conservation in the way that we might. 
Um, and we've got some good examples of that as well, um, where partners came together, you're like, oh, that's, that's surprising. And there was one of the, of the 12, I think, stories mentioned in the book, two of them uh, we actually ended up using in our, in our series. Um, one of them is a story about the uh, red cockaded woodpecker and how biologists were trying to save it. They found that it was actually uh, the one place that they were thriving was on a military firing range in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, it turned out that without knowing it, the military was actually taking better care of these than the biologists were. Uh, they were at odds at the beginning, and then they joined forces to save the species. And now local farmers who previously had been um, cutting down trees that the woodpeckers favored because they were worried that if woodpeckers were found on their, on their properties because they were protected, they wouldn't be able to use their proper, utilize their properties. So they would literally cut down the trees before woodpeckers could be found. Now they've embraced this whole philosophy as well that was sort of started with the, uh, uh, with the military base and are actually preserving their land for the woodpeckers. So I think that's one of my favorite stories of an unexpected alliance where you just wouldn't have thought that that's how it would have taken place. Um, the local action, I think that's another thing that's really important to us in this series. We are um, global in reach in that we are storing, tel st telling stories all over the world, but we are telling really intimate local stories at each location. So how are people in one particular place addressing the problems that they face there? Is there a model in what they're doing that could be applied to other places? Um, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for. Also, it's, it's not all scientists, and I think that's other, the other thing that's really important about the series. We have scientists in them. We want, the work, we want to showcase work that is scientifically and data-driven, but quite often it's not the scientists who are taking the lead on these projects. It's local people who have recognized the, the problems, have also recognized the, the solutions. And so again, that's an, I think what, one of the things that makes this, this, or, this feel fresh and unique. And as I said before, it's, you know, it's about a dose of hope. It's about saying in, a, in an increasingly cynical world, in a world where most of what we hear is about doom and gloom when it comes to the environment, we're trying to show here are some examples of actually work that's being done that's making a difference. Um, all about sparking that next step for us, which is the, the activation. We want our audiences to watch these pieces, be inspired by these pieces, recognize that wherever they are, whatever their circumstances, there are ways that they can be involved. Um, the easiest way is to share these pieces. That's my least favorite action because it, to me, I think we can do better than that, but it also helps with getting the word out and, and letting people know that these stories exist. From there, we're trying through the website to create all kinds of different ways that people can get involved. Um, you know, everything from donating money, our, our axolotl film from season one, uh, just as we were launching it, the scientists launched a campaign where you could, um, you could donate dinner to an axolotl. You could buy a house for an axolotl. You could save an ecosystem for an axolotl. And we were able with this film, because it wasn't tied up in rights and licenses, we were able to say, you know what? We can point people to your page where, you want, where you're asking people to donate. We can also give you this film to use at your events to help promote it. So I think, again, a really important point. Um, we want the scientists and the participants in these films to use these films. We're creating them in a way that they should be useful to them as well as to the public audience. Um, so that's one example of a call to action. Another one, one of my favorites, we have a film on beavers. And um, you can get involved with the beaver research by helping NASA scientists analyze uh, satellite images from, Earth, from space to uh, find beaver dams. Like, I don't know, I think that's pretty cool to sit at home when you're bored and, and uh, you know, try to pinpoint uh, beaver dams. Um, but the idea is really every different way. You can plant a pollinator garden in your backyard, um, a native species. So the idea is we're trying to throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall when it comes to the activation. And at, over time, we'll start to see what are the ones that are actually connecting, what are the ones that are leading to action. And we're trying, because we're short form, because we're data driven, because we're on social media, we can make adjustments too. So I think one of our most recent findings, and Ray I think is here somewhere, she was involved in a lot of the research behind this stuff, is that one of our, what we thought was one of our exciting points was citizen science, <coughs> which, is, which is big in the States. Um, we were finding that that term wasn't really hitting the way we thought it would. 
that citizen science as a term, citizen science as a way to get activated, was not really the one that was driving people to action. So now we're adjusting, uh, both in terms of how we set stuff up, but also in terms of the, the, the different kinds of opportunities we can create for people to get involved. Um, so I think we'll start off, uh, we'll show you a 90 second reel, and then we've got a few other clips to show, and I'm gonna open it up to these guys, and we'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of stories we're looking for, the selection process, and all that, and then um, you know we'll, we'll just kind of work our way through, and then we've got some other fun videos to show a little bit later on. So this is a uh, 90 second reel from Instagram um, that uh, you know, has been pretty successful for us. If it works. These are leatherback sea turtles. We know so little about leatherbacks, especially at the hatchling and juvenile sizes. We've seen the populations of other sea turtles increase over time, especially due to different kinds of protections. But the leatherbacks especially are very mysterious and unknown. And you need to know about a species before you can help it. We're starting to learn what route the turtles are going to take and what they're going to encounter along those long migrations. And each year we get a little more information about where these little turtles go. So. So as you can see, so this is an episode, 90 second reel, uh, derivative of a 15 minute piece. But as you can see, it tells the story and it tries to hit those themes that we, that I talked about earlier. It's showing a little bit of scientific process. It's showing hope. Um, so if that's all people see of this story, we hope they'll walk away inspired and, and understanding a little bit more about this effort. And then if they want to, they can go watch that longer episode too. Uh, I think I was supposed to turn it over to Jeff a little earlier as well. So let me, let me turn to Jeff and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what we're looking for on these episodes and then we'll show you a little bit more. Sure, uh, thanks and thanks everybody uh, for being here. I also just want to give a quick shout out to our uh, co-executive producer, Sarah Arnoff, who's watching live in Los Angeles, California. Um, it's like 1 a.m. there, um, uh, but she also really loves Newfoundland, what we're doing here, and the, the whole team. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that Jared brought up is, you know, well, why, why hope and why storytelling? We know from science that the, the, the best way to sort of um, facilitate or inspire action is through narrative storytelling. It's by telling someone a story, you actually have a greater chance of them doing something. And we also know that the more you have a negative uh, story, the more likely they are going to um, the less likely you're going to take action, the more likely you're going to sit back and not do much. So a lot of these stories and, and the whole project in that way is designed to tell stories to show these things can be done, these things are being done. They're being done, yes, sometimes by scientists, but oftentimes by people like you, as Jared was saying, local people who are just finding ways to do this, teachers, students, gardeners, whomever it might be, who are finding ways in their community to, uh, to impact local uh, biodiversity loss and reverse it. So we also are looking for stories where that the idea that they're having and some, some kind of different innovation that they're bringing in the way that they're doing conservation is not only surprising in some fashion, right? That you're like, wait, I, you know, what? Someone's putting oysters back into New York Harbor. Like, I thought that place was a, a garbage pit or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's, you're surprised by it, but then there's also, there's proven science. There's ways where it's showing that it's working. So, because there's all sorts of good ideas that may or may not work. So what we're trying to do is to highlight stories that show that these things are working. And so maybe something like that might work near you. One of our most popular pieces is about a former garden designer who basically realized one day when she saw all these animals getting pushed out of a thicket that was being 
you know, removed for a new house and garden that was being put in down the road from her, that she was part of the problem, and now she advocates for anyone to give half of whatever land they have access to, to give it back to nature. And that can include just a, a window box in a city, let the nature, let the natural plants come back. So, we, you know, we're looking at people who are, you know, building vertical meadows on walls, biodiverse meadows, meadows on, on skyscrapers in London. So, you know, sometimes it's a very simple idea, sometimes it's a higher tech idea, but there are all these sorts of um, different sort of innovative approaches that these people are simply trying. And then what we do is we want to follow that process, as Jared was saying, we want to, we want to meet them, we want to go through um, uh, an arc of experience with them to find out where they, where they, um, like, you know, first off, let our audience know early on, like, hey, this is going to turn out okay, provide context for what's happening in this region and what the challenges are about this particular issue, and then see how they're affecting a change. And so I think you know, and, and trying to do things that are topical. I think the next clip we have is uh, one of the ones from season one, where one of the things we thought was really interesting to highlight is uh, a new legal movement that's catching on around the world, which is the rights of nature. And so Ecuador was the first nation on the planet to enshrine the, right, the legal rights of nature to exist in its, not only in a law, but actually in its constitution. And then there are, act, you know, conservationists within Ecuador who are then using that to protect um, different areas, including they've just turned around like one of the largest mining um, ventures in, in the country by saying the species that live in this particular area have a right to exist and the mine is threatening those endemic species, right? So, th but this is a big idea and it's an idea that we're actually following up in season two with another project that's looking at a different application of the rights of nature as a concept in Panama. So there's ways where sometimes it's an idea, so, you know, it's some kind of innovation, but there's also a way in which we want these to be, you know, in, in some cases upbeat and fun, and, but no matter what, we want to try to connect with the viewer. And so there's also that side, and, and if some of you were here for my storytelling workshop on, uh, on Monday morning, you know, we're also trying to connect with the people who are doing this work and have their work and themselves come through. So maybe we can take a look at the, at the next one, which is a, a, a clip from the end of that, where that, the, the Rights of Nature episode, where they're actually, they discovered this, this uh, youth-funded organization that's creating a new reserve, discovered miners like in an area they're not allowed to be, and then was going out to do a biodiversity blitz to find endemic species in that area so they can then use the law to protect that area and make sure the mine couldn't just come in and take over. And before we hit play, breaking news uh, indicating the power of Noof, we've just broken 20,000 yes! on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you, Noof. Thank you, Noof. Here we have a salamander. This is gonna be a new species for the science. And it's the second time that I'm watching this. We only have pictures the first time, but now we can have a, a sample. Different levels of creatures live from the very, very bottom of each tree to the canopy. Every level have different plants, different shapes, different species. These small species have one chance to be recognized, not only as an object. They are subjects of rights. These creatures give us the chance to play, to save these places. This is the reason why I am working here. Every new species they find now has a fighting chance to still be here generations from now. Finley's legacy is very much alive in Reserva. Remember that she's not here to take action, so I have to. And that helps me keep going. La naturaleza el día de hoy no tiene tiempo. Hemos eh, hecho un esfuerzo bien grande para defender este, este tema. Pero. Eh, no es fácil. Para mí, Reserva es mi fuente de inspiración de cada día.
Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and so one of the things that's also happened and, and uh, as we've gone from season one to season two, and now as we're looking forward into season three, is we've also looked at different models of the way we are making these pieces. Um, we had the great privilege of working with Ago in the first season where he worked as a field producer for us um, on, on a piece about uh, a coffee initiative that he can explain that uh, has been going on in Gordon Gosa National Park, which is really this extraordinarily interesting and innovative approach to uh, supporting communities uh, that are living with wildlife, but also in this case using uh, an, uh, an agri uh, agronomy to try to help also help restore a, a, um, a, a, what am I trying to say? Rainforest at the top of a mountain that was critical to the watershed for all the people and the wildlife and the, and the uh, place below. But what's also been really exciting, and we'll talk about this afterward, is that we've also, you know, um, been talking to the new fellows, and now as they've done their final projects, they've had opportunities to make those projects be whatever they want, and then to have the, the, the use of that, those films, and to take them wherever they want, put them out into the world the way they want. But they also, we talked it over, and do you guys want to try to make them into Wild Hope? And which is a different kind of relationship, right? You can make your own film, or we've talked about where you're making a film for a client. So I think Ago could talk about where the difference between when you're making it yourself and then when you're working as either a field producer or on one of the three projects that the, the um, Storytelling Lab fellows are doing now as the producer of that piece and what those changing relationships are. But maybe you could, maybe you could set up the, the clip and tell us a little bit about the program and then about your experience in those different modalities. Okay. Uh, <coughs> dia. It, it feels good to greeting to greeting the the audience in Portuguese. Last year, I think we we're only four four Mozambicans, so seeing a lot of brothers here, yeah, it's uh, it's really good. So, so this uh, the coffee for water episode. The reason it fitted on the Wild Hope, uh, Wild Hope series is because it fits on what they are looking for. Stories of people who are changing or are giving hope uh, and saving the nature. So for this episode, we, fuck, we, we, were, sh we were filming uh, people on a mountain restoring the mountain. Why they're restoring it? So Gorongosa Mountain, uh, Unfortunately, uh, activities such as uh, burning and slashing agriculture destroyed most of the rainforest. So in order to recover this mountain, the parks create this um, reforestation program. You can, at the end of the day, it's all about people. It doesn't matter if you come and you have like this good idea, you have your science, but if you don't involve local people you won't succeed. That's why our approach is different from the co for, for the reforestation uh, program. So what we did, we decided to grow coffee. The coffee that we are growing on the mountain, it's a coffee that to grow well, it needs, uh, it needs shade. So what do you do? To have uh, good productivity, you have to plant uh, trees that they will provide the shade for the coffee. And by doing that, we are, first, we are recovering the forest. At the same time, we are giving a, a source of income to the community because we give them the seedlings, we give them the native plants, and they go there, they plant, and when they harvest, they sell back to the park. Good, we are saving the mountain. Why we should save the mountain? Because the mountain is so important not only for the people who live around the park. It's very important for the park as well because the water that flows down from the mountain passes through the community and they use the water and it goes to the park. And during the dry season, uh, the water that comes from the mountain, it's what helps a lot of animals to, to be okay during the dry season. So that's why uh, it's it's, a, it's an inspiring, it's a good story, and we are very happy with the final product because it shows what we are doing on the mountain. So we're going to play a little clip. It's from the end of the film. So uh, you know, it's great that Agos talked through 
what the film is about, and this is uh, sort of the end where you're getting a sense of um, what it's done. Project Dar es Salaam de Gorongosa e característica única na minha vida que coloca as comunidades humanas no epicentro para a conservação da biodiversidade. As pessoas podem só dançar o cântico da conservação quando conseguem satisfazer as necessidades básicas, a alimentação, mandar suas crianças para as escolas, construir casa, Quando eu comparo os resultados antes e depois, dá-me muita força. Isso me dá muita esperança de que vamos ter melhor conservação do que antes. Sem, sem esta Serra da Gorongosa, não é possível termos, termos, termos o parque. A história do Café da Gorongosa. O Café da Gorongosa, o historial é muito bonito. Pra... É um historial que tem algumas pessoas que fizeram parte deste, deste projeto. Sinto muito feliz, sinto muito feliz em saber que ah, tem pessoas que estão, acordam, tomam nosso café, mesmo sem saber quem é que plantou, quem colheu esse café, quem esteve em frente desse café. Então, e eu sei que também estamos, estamos a alegrar muitas pessoas fora, fora de, de, de Moçambique. Yeah, so this is this is the end of the uh, of the film. Talking about experience, um, uh, it's at the beginning. Uh, it's hard to accept a feedback, and one of the things that I've learned all all over these years from workshops, from events like this, from mentors, it's you have to know uh, if this is your personal project and where you want to end up with it. If it's a if you are, you are doing this for a client, you have to stick to what the client wants. So it's hard, but over the years you kind of learn and then you know if you are shooting something for a client, you have to stick to what uh, you have to deliver. And if you're shooting for yourself, then you have the space to be more creative and do the product that you think is the, is the best product that you want to you, you wanna deliver it. And talking about the experience from working uh, for this uh, episode, it has a field producer and the second cameraman. Uh, I remember receiving the call, but before telling that, I have to, I have to say, uh, Janada as well, she was working with us on this episode. So, Janada. And this is the good thing about working with uh, with local, with local people, when you have like this, when you have a uh, film or product to shoot, is that I remember Jeff called me uh, when we were almost done with the script. We knew what the story we want to shoot, and it was like, "Yeah, I got the window to shoot this is February," and I was like, "No, it's not happening. Why? Because I'm from there. I know February is a raining season. You can drive up to the mountain." And he ended up accepting because he knows that I know my house. I know how things work. We push it. And budget-wise, I mean, it's hard to, to shoot a project for like a month or, or two months. You have to stick to the local community because you're bringing people in that are new for those people in the community. And if you want to get the real story, if you want to get the truth, 
you need to be next to someone who knows them, who can make them be comfortable, and they can tell you the story. As so what we did for this for, for these episodes, the crew came, and we are always with them. And I remember one of the conversations I was having with Danny, Danny was the producer, and he was like, you know, it's hard to come here for this short period of the shooting and then interview people. So I'm gonna need you by my side. I think you are the only one who can talk to them, who can let them tell us this story. And so what is what happened. So, but then I just wanna say how important it is to include the local people when you have like, when you have like shootings because we are the ones who know the story. We are the ones who know the characters. We are the ones who can help you getting the, the product that you want. So it's always good to rely on local people and any kind of production. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think to, to build on that point, um, you know, the series, season one, we worked with a production company um, called Part Two Pictures in New York. Uh, season two, we've worked with uh, Red Rock Films in, uh, in, in DC area. But the goal of the series is to really find ways to partner with local producers wherever possible. Um, you know, this story in particular, it's a story I knew well because I've made a couple of films um, at Goren Goes Up, but from the first time we started talking about this film, Ago's name was the first name that came up. It was sort of like, well, we can't do this story without Ago. Um, you know, both because he had the insights, he knew all the details of it, he knew, you know, we knew we would get better interviews from the local people if it was Ago doing those and setting those up. Um, so it was, it was just a no-brainer for us that, like, the best way to tell this story is with Ago as, a, as an integral part of the team. Um, that's an example we try to do wherever we can. It doesn't always work that way. Um, but it's, it's the direction we want the series to move in. Um, and as I said, the first two seasons were with U.S.-based production companies um, who were handling the day-to-day -day of production. We will, in season three, continue to do that. We'll continue to work with those, with, with, um, with Red Rock again. But we're also looking to create the space where we will up make other films that aren't with Red Rock, that are also Wild Hopes. We have a format for the series, so um, you know, we, we can show people this is what we're trying to do but we'd much rather that they were produced entirely in Mozambique or entirely in South Africa or entirely in Brazil um, rather than flying in teams. Or, you know, ideally in, in many cases, it's a combination of both. It's flying in one person with and partnering them with local production as well. So I think we're, one of the goals of the series is to be really open to different models that get us the deliverables at the quality that we need and with all the releases and all the other stuff that go along with it, but do it in a way that is helping to promote local production to tell local stories because we just think you're gonna get, we're, we're gonna get better stories by doing it that way. No, 100%, and what I can also say about the shift from first season to second season is that we actually have been doing that um, where we've been partnering, we partnered with a uh, production company in Brazil, produced four films there with them. The only people who went there was a producer who knows, here's what Wild Hope, what the story is, here's the series style, right, to then collaborate with a completely Brazilian team to produce those films. We just wrapped another uh, shoot in India with an Indian production company doing the exact same thing. So where, you know, basically someone who's going in in an executive role or a producer role to be able to say, okay, we're making this for a client and then that client's me and then I have my client Jared and so we're all doing that. So you were working and I was working there and then that's how, you know, that's, the, as you were saying, um, it's working where it's not a, it's not a personal project but it's a, it's a place that hopefully you can find space for personal investment, personal creativity and personal satisfaction as you're doing a, a, a story that you can believe in, you can help shape. Because it wasn't, I mean, I remember that and you were just, I was like, we need to go in February. It's like, no man. <laughs> And I'm like, all right, like you know, and, and it wasn't just that. There were there were throughout that process. Whom should we talk to? What? Where is the story? Oh, we need to talk to these are the people we need to highlight. And so we've been doing that with the, those different local production teams, and we're looking to do more of that. Um, so so thank you for all of that that guidance and insight, and it, and it's also exciting to feel that opening. And thank you for making that space for us to to keep going in that direction. And then one of the things that's been so excited is then the, the, the science film fellows as well. Yeah, so uh, you know, in, in terms of making that space, we're gonna shift gears a little bit because I think one of the other things 
we've been involved with at Tangle Bank was the Science Fellowship, um, the New Science Gorongosa Fellowship. And that's a project that um, kind of evolved in a couple, uh, over the course of a couple of years, and where we landed with it was um, this fellowship that is, was taking, as Noel mentioned earlier, is taking, science, uh, it's taking filmmakers up to Gorongosa to do these profiles of the master's students, and also to create other films. Um, about Gorongosa. So clearly a Gorongosa theme here this morning, which um, is great. You know, we love because there's so much to learn from the work that's being done there. Um, it's a model for so many different aspects of conservation. So, you know, an opportunity to tell more of those stories was just thrilling for us. Um, and as, as Noel mentioned, or as, as Jeff mentioned, what we were trying to do there with these longer pieces is give people, give the teams a sense of the kinds of stories we were looking for, give them the opportunity to find those stories, give them the opportunity to shoot those stories, and then all along the way decide, for, for both us and for them, decide if we feel like those are Wild Hope stories. If not, then they should be great films anyway, and if so, then they'll be great Wild, wild Hope stories. And either way, it's a flexibility, I think it's a great example of um, an opportunity for the filmmakers to see both sides of it. There's, there's, you know, great positives to it being a wild hope because it's going into the wild hope machine and it's going to get huge viewership and and all that other great stuff. On the other hand, then you have to make it as a wild hope. If you don't want to go in that direction, you've got a whole other story, a whole other way to tell that story, which may be better, different, doesn't matter. Um, but then you get to have your vision more than if you're working for a client and, and you know, committing to a series. So I think with that, let's call Noel back up. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the fellowship. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, I mean, this was one of the largest undertakings that we ever did um, as, as, as an organization in terms of our labs or our fellowships. This is one of our really long and, and really biggest, biggest sort of fellowships. What we've come to realize with the labs is, whilst they're great, if they're not consistent and you can't follow up, then it's almost as if you come and I tease you with a little something, or I take you on a red, I, you know, take you to play with this camera for a week, and then you go back home and never ever have access to that camera again, and then that's just defeating the whole, the whole purpose. And so, again, James Byrne and I, back in uh, APAC, uh, were dreaming this up and flipping it back and forth. We had already done what we were calling the Wild Science, uh, Wild Woman Media Labs uh, with, with you guys during COVID. Um, and, and, you know, we didn't want to follow any of the other models that were happening at some of the international film festivals where it's a one week um, a lab and that is it. We wanted to create a fellowship and um, tomorrow we'll speak a lot more about our program Africa Refocus and the fact that it's a collaboration between NUF and National Geographic Society. But what that program allows us to do is because we are anchored in that partnership, in that collaboration, we are then able to um, go and look for, more me for, for other meaningful partnerships that can take on a project of this kind of size. And essentially it was 12 filmmakers uh, who we paired with 12 scientists who were doing their masters um, um, doing their masters in conservation biology in Gorongosa National Park and we challenged each of them to tell a story and do a profile film on each of those scientists that was the one thing the second thing was the opportunity to produce a Wild Hope film and they were, those 12 filmmakers were divided into three teams and each of them were, re were required to produce a, sh a, a Wild Hope film or, as you just said, if they wanted to, if they wanted to take it, here's the brief, here's the RFP, you decide how you want to take it and where you want to go with it. They had to pitch, they had to develop the story, they had to do the research, they had to pitch. But what this fellowship gave us was unbelievable access to one of the Edens in Africa, right? One of the most special places on, on the planet. We had unbelievable access, um, you know, for months at a time 
um, and, and being able to take filmmakers and embed them in a park with that level of support is just, you know, crazy to think that we have that. Um, and then the last challenge is they've got to go back after this to their home countries and select a scientist in their home country and do a short profile on, their, on, on the scientists in their, in their home country. We are now at the end of the second phase. The other day we showed you, the, or we've been showing you the profile forms. Uh, we're very excited that they've gotten to this point with the Wild Hope films. We're going to see, they're not complete. We're going to see where they are. They are almost there. One, um, and, you know, whilst one is leaning very strongly, and we won't tell you which one, towards being a Wild Hope, the other two have a choice. Uh, in terms of whether they want to change it and make it that. Uh, but it's, it's their choice, and that's really the cool thing about this, is that ability to choose to tell the stories that you want to. One last thing I want to say about this fellowship before they come up and introduce their films is we did something really magical here, yeah? and the legacy and the impact of this fellowship is going to last for many years to come. Each one of and I have their permission for me to tell you all about this. Each one of the filmmakers, the fellows, got a $14,000 gear package. That is theirs. That is theirs to keep and to use after the fellowship. One of the, film, one of the fellows, one of the filmmakers, has just completed, he was the main DOP on a very big funded documentary series here in South Africa using his own gear, right? And that's, that really changes the narrative. That's really changing the game. That's real impact. And I think that's the most important thing, um, you know, that that's, the work that we are trying to do. Um, and so we're very excited to show you some of these films. Um, I'm going to call up the first group. They call themselves Wonder Crew. Uh, it just so happened, I promise you, there were four women. We did everything, I swear, it's been recorded. We did everything possible, for, and they pulled names out of a hat, and it ended up being four women on the same team. When there was three, we changed it around, and they still pulled it up that way. I guess you speaking for them. I am, after all, the voice of the people, as well, and an ambassador. Well, uh, I was very suspicious of that process, because they took a hat, they put all the names. Janari was the first lady to come out. She takes Samira, I'm like, yes. Then she takes Tumi, I'm like, wait a minute, what's happening? And then she takes Chisomo. And that's how the Wonder Crew is born. <laughs> so, <laughs> we had a few suggestions of teams. We had a few suggestions of projects. We ended up embracing the Map of Life, which is an amazing project that has been going for the past 10 years in the Gorongosa National Park with Dr. Pietro Naskreki. And they were doing an expedition to the Sheringoma Plateau. In case you haven't noticed, I'm in round shape. It's not easy to run after those scientists. They're superheroes. They walk fast. And then we decided on a story within the map of light, life that's very broad. We decided to follow young Cesaria Huo. You already know her. She's a celebrity. She's in Agos film. And talk about how this connection with a local company from Mozambique that extracts guano from caves is happening with an unlikely alliance that shows how economic growth can actually be associated with conservation because they're relying on scientists to tell them if they can extract from those caves, how they can, when they can, so we do not have, have our backs to each other, we can actually walk together. And who are we, you ask? We are? Right, so we're going to play that video. This is, as, as Noel mentioned, this is a work in progress of uh, that film.
Eu tenho a certeza que o desenvolvimento econômico pode estar, sim, alinhado à conservação e à preservação dos recursos naturais. Estamos agora à procura de criar indústrias sustentáveis, principalmente pensando nas comunidades locais, que possam beneficiar o crescimento econômico e também garantir a conservação do meio ambiente. Desde criança, sempre gostei muito de ciências naturais. Sempre foi uma das minhas disciplinas favoritas. Eu sou natural de Maputo, sou uma jovem moçambicana. Sou formada em ensino de biologia. Para mim, ser cientista é estar em frente, a ser um líder da produção de conhecimento. E eu, no caso, escolhi biologia porque gosto muito da natureza. Para mim, estudar os seres vivos e tudo aquilo que garante que nós possamos estar vivos é extremamente interessante. E sinto-me ainda mais feliz por ter a oportunidade de estar a contemplar paisagens incríveis no meu próprio país. Like many countries around the world, Mozambique faces what's often framed as a fateful either-or decision. Provide economic opportunity for its citizens or safeguard the country's natural heritage. Meanwhile, far from the city, significant strides in conservation have been underway for 20 years within Gorongosa National Park. Spanning more than 1,500 square miles, This park is located in the heart of central Mozambique. Its success stems from a unique approach that focuses not only on wildlife, but on the people who live around it. Now, Cesare is part of an initiative that aims to balance conservation and commerce. And it all hinges on an unlikely resource that comes from a surprising source. But, Gorongosa has large populations of bats. Uh, it has a, a, an extensive network of apes where those uh, bats live. Pietro Nascrecchi is a biologist who surveying the park's astonishing biodiversity. My main job here is to document life of Gorongosa, meaning I'm building what we call the Gorongosa Map of Life, which is a, a big multi-dimensional database of all uh, living organisms in the greater Gorongosa ecosystem, the connections between them, and how uh, it all fits into the landscape of this place. He's also Cesaria's teacher and supports her work studying the park's bats. She is a, a phenomenal a young scientist, and she is literally the first African scientist who is studying social communication in bats. But these bats aren't just of interest to science. Others are surprisingly seeking something they produce, their droppings. Bat guana is, is sought after uh, across the world uh, as, as an organic fertilizer. Harvesting the guano could provide important income to people who live near the park but it could also endanger some of the rare species that live here. Cesare hopes to find a middle ground where development is led by science, and she aims to do it with a company called Guano Moss in her own town. Guano Moss is an company Mozambican dedicated to extraction, production and commercialization of guano. Uma das grandes vantagens do guano sendo um fertilizante orgânico, biológico, é que ele tem propriedades que em inglês chama, chamaria de slow release. Portanto, quando aplicamos no solo, ele dura muito tempo. Diferente dos fertilizantes sintéticos, que aplica-se com uma chuva, eles desaparecem e acabam contaminando o solo. Guano is rich in macro and micronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium that enrich the soil with organic matter. It also has microorganisms that break it down, making it easier for plants to absorb the nutrients. 
This will remain in the soil afterwards, allowing long-term benefits. That makes it valuable, and the company wants to explore Gorongosa to see if they can sustainably harvest any guano there. This leads them to expand to Sheringoma, a community conservation area known for having the largest guano reserves in the country and where Cesaria studies bats. Vamos fazer uma viagem para as grutas para identificar quais são as espécies de morcegos nestas grutas e com base nisso perceber qual é a qualidade do guano e também conseguir estimar as quantidades de guano que estão nestas grutas. Cesaria and her team will survey the caves to determine which may be suitable and don't endanger the park's unique plants and wildlife. O trabalho dos cientistas é uh, fazer o levantamento das espécies que lá existem, ter um conhecimento da biologia das espécies que lá estão e uh, recomendar as melhores formas de extração deste mesmo recurso. Devemos evitar o máximo, não apenas perturbar as colônias, mas também o próprio abrigo. Então, parte do trabalho é também recolher estas fezes e analisá-las para poder recomendar as melhores formas de extração deste recurso uh, de uma forma uh, biossegura. O guano em, em Xiringoma, em particular, não só é mais abundante, portanto, tem, tem, tem mais quantidade, mas vimos que a qualidade também é superior à que nós encontramos em, em Açora. Isto porque a espécie de morcegos que encontramos lá são, uh, alimentam-se de insectos. Então, os morcegos que alimentam-se de insectos acabam produzindo um estrume mais, mais potente. The collaboration between Guanamos and the Gorongosa National Park also provides job opportunities for the local community. A extração é feita contratando jovens locais, homens, mulheres. Em Xiringoma, em particular, vamos ter uma política de ter pelo menos 50% mulheres. Isto indicado pela própria comunidade. Today, the unlikely alliance is bringing new hope for sustainable economic growth in this remote region, all while protecting the creatures that live here, including some that live nowhere else on Earth. Tenho a esperança que este projeto, esta colaboração entre o Parque Nacional da Gorongosa e a Guanumós possa beneficiar as comunidades e também uh, ser um excelente exemplo de como soluções sustentáveis podem garantir o crescimento econômico e beneficiar também ao nosso planeta. Eu acredito que isso poderá ser um ótimo exemplo a nível nacional, mas também internacional de soluções sustentáveis e baseadas na natureza. Eu acredito que o ser humano pode, sim, florescer sem destruir o nosso planeta. Yeah. And uh, moving along very swiftly, um, the wild dog team, please. Dogs. Moha, are you Moha? No, there's a Moha. Who's <laughs> the spa? Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Yeah, that's much better. Um, uh, we are the um, African <laughs> African group. <laughs> um, we had the privilege of uh, uh, going to Gorongosa last year uh, to, yes, oh, we had the privilege of going to Gorongosa last year to, you know, work and cover a group of Mozambican scientists um, uh, led by uh, local Mozambican scientist and vet, uh, Antonio Paulo uh, Tonekash, I hope he's watching, shout out to him. Uh, and um, we had to track uh, wild dogs, locally known as Mabekosh, over a period of a month. Um, we were lucky to spot them on day one, uh, and you'd think that uh, for dogs that give birth uh, 
similar to rabbits, it would be easier to spot them. Uh, but uh, that was the last we saw of them for the for a period of like three weeks. And we were only able to spot them four days uh, towards the end of our stay. Uh, luckily, we have a great team. Uh, shout out to our DOP, uh, Nathan, uh, cinematographer and uh, drone guy, and uh, our producer, uh, Shabs. And um, so where we are right now is to uh, basically do the card to produce, uh, or rather make it into a Wild Hope um, series, uh, getting some great comments from the HMI team, uh, from Noel, who loves to hate us sometimes, but we are working on it. So without further ado, um, let Alma Bekos play. Thank you. Trabalho com os Mabecos desde 2018 e tenho uma enorme paixão por essa espécie que está em risco de extinção. African wild dogs disappeared from Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique more than 30 years ago. But they were recently reintroduced in the hope of re-establishing a wild population here. Their success or failure here may depend on one very special dog. A beira é super mãe. Ela não é qualquer um. Ela é líder. E as características são bem visíveis. Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, once a war zone, is now bouncing back as one of the great safe havens for so many animals in Africa. Across the continent, wild dog populations have plummeted due to habitat fragmentation, poaching and disease, and the species has been listed as endangered since 1990. But here in Gorongosa, they are slowly bouncing back. Baira foi uma das primeiras matilhas reintroduzidas no parque quando chegou em 2018 e viram as características dela. Por isso preferiram dar o capital da província de Sofala, que é Beira. Some of the dogs are installed with GPS trackers. Nós colocamos as fêmeas alfas com colar. E nós monitoramos quando estão gestantes e quando o sinal desaparece. Normalmente a fêmea entra uh, no DNA ao sair do DNA, a primeira posição, a segunda, o mesmo sítio, é o indicador de que a alfa já teve crias. Normalmente, as crias começam a sair fora já com três, quatro semanas. Beira is the alpha female of her pack. This doesn't only make her the main progenitor, but also the leader of the hunt. O que torna os mabecos como top caçadores é porque eles caçam em grupo. Une esforço. Às vezes forma uma barreira, uma linha grande e começa sempre a vasculhar as presas. É super ver uma becos a caçar. Back at the den, the pups wait for Beira to return. When the pack returns, she and the other adults regurgitate their food for the pups. Beira tem muitos genes espalhados ao nível do parque. E já deu-nos desde 2018 seis ninhadas. As impressive as this makes Beira, it also poses a problem for dogs in Gorongosa quando não temos genes muito forte. Qualquer doença, eles podem desaparecer. E por isso agora estamos a fazer o esforço de reintroduzir mais mabecos. New wild dogs have to be introduced from parks in South Africa. They have been tranquilized to ensure their safety and that of the team that's caring for them. The dogs are monitored closely by Antonio and his team of vets who collect biological data from the dogs to examine their health and record their genes. Introducing novos indivíduos 
garantimos que esses mesmos indivíduos vão poder dispersar-se e formar novos, novos grupos. E esses novos grupos serão um grupo, vão cruzar e formar indivíduos resistentes geneticamente. E resistentes a mudanças climáticas, tanto como doenças. Antonio e seu time têm muito trabalho em suas mãos. Não só tentando manter os genes dos dogs diversos, mas também continuamente monitoring os dogs. It has now come time for Bayer's GPS color to be changed. The mission will require not only the right dosage of tranquilizer, but also the ability to dart the dog from a distance. Antonio's team, who have been tracking Bayer, find that she has moved out from the dense bush into an open area, which will make darting her easier. Bayer's pack recognizes Antonio's vehicle and starts spreading out in order to confuse him. However, the dogs all maintain a proximity to Bayer in order to protect their leader. Antonio needs a new plan. He gets aboard a tourist vehicle, which Bayer is less suspicious of. Ela é muito inteligente. Yeah, go slowly in front, in front. Yeah. Ela consegue perceber e distancia-se. E ela percebe das ameaças e rapidamente afasta-se. Toma. Talvez por isso torna ela super líder da matilha. The tranquilizer lasts only 15 minutes. Just enough time for her color to be changed. O futuro para Mabegos aqui no parque é brilhante. Vermos que esta população está a crescer rapidamente. E também o histórico já mostra que isto era um stronghold em termos de Mabegos. A nossa estratégia agora qual é que é? A oferecer indivíduos para a formação de PECs, como já fizemos, translocamos alguns indivíduos para Malau. Isto garantimos que os Mabecos vão continuar por muito, muito tempo. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well done, guys. Uh, first time I saw that. Um, um, with that, I'm just worried about lunchtime, so I'm going to move this along and call up Team Pangolin. There we go. I'm just holding the mic. It won't be me talking. It'll be Aina. If it says two words in Portuguese, two words in Portuguese. Two words? Yeah. Bom dia. Como está? Yeah, como é que é, bro? All right. Um, we are the... the no, no, yeah, the pangolin team. So, <coughs> officially the pangolin team. Uh, yeah, um, it's been a great honor to work with these two amazing filmmakers. Uh, working with Pangolin gave us a lot of, you know, uh, more knowledge about this beautiful, uh, very endangered animal in Africa, in, in, in Asia, but in Africa mainly. And uh, yeah, it, it was a process going every day, every early morning to shoot these Pangolins and being always in this guy's frame. <laughs> Every time we shoot, you're like, "Hey, Aina, get out of my frame!" Every time, so it was, <laughs> it was a lot of uh, learning and um, joy, and sometimes also we are very lucky. We had the chance to see the release of the pangolin in this 
only, one and only rehabilitation center in Mozambique about pangolin. It, and it is in Gorongosa National Park. And we worked with this wonderful vet, Elias Mububu, which I hope is watching now. And yeah, I will not say more. Um, we're very happy to show you the, the pangolin, guys. Yeah. Yeah? Hey, so what? Aqui em África, o pangolin tem um grande significado para as comunidades. Na minha em particular, quando nós vemos o pangolin, quer dizer que neste ano haverá muita chuva, haverá muita produção, é um ano que não haverá fome. E a pessoa que vê, dizem que pode ter mais anos de vida, tem um significado extremamente importante para a minha tradição. Infelizmente, nos dias de hoje, o pangolim é o animal de vida selvagem mais traficado do mundo. Como as pessoas continuam a traficar uma espécie como esta? Eu sinto que o meu trabalho está a ser uma esperança para o aumento da população de pangolins. Falando da minha infância, apareceu a ideia por alto, que tal, um dia trabalhar no Parque Nacional da Grangosa, eu via-me ver assim, Parque Nacional da Grangosa, Parque Nacional da Grangosa. Depois de terminar a faculdade, que não estava na minha mente, mas pronto, houve umas vagas para estágio no Parque Nacional da Grangosa, pela coincidência, entrei, comecei a estagiar e por fim me contrataram, teve uma coisa incrível. In the heart of central Mozambique, there is the Korongosa National Park, which is one of the most ecologically diverse regions in the world. The more than 4,000 square kilometers park is home to a large biodiversity where animals, plants, and people interact. Elias grew up near the park, but had never seen one of its most elusive creatures. A primeira vez que eu vi o pangolim foi na faculdade. É um pangolim que, que estava no laboratório em forma de amostra, mas vivo foi no Parque Nacional da Grangosa. Aí é, o sentimento foi o outro. Uau, afinal o pangolim é assim. Sadly, sighting of pangolins become increasingly scarce each year. As ameaças que os pangolins estão a ter no mundo, um dos primeiros é o ser humano. É a primeira ameaça para o pangolim. Porque nos últimos anos, o tráfico ilegal de pangolim tem aumentado exponencialmente. É estimado que até 200 mil pangolins são tomados do wild every year across África e Ásia. They are poached for the skills that are used in traditional medicine. Eu particularmente me sinto triste. Por quê? É aquilo pensar como um ser humano faz esse tipo de atividade. Para além de ser extremamente importante para o meio ambiente, porque é um animal também que tem direito à vida como nós. To help protect the pangolins, Elias works at the only rehabilitation center in Mozambique, located in Korongosa National Park. Here, they care for animals rescued from the illegal market. Nós recebemos pangolins com diferentes patologias. Estamos a falar de pangolins debilitados por causa dos maus tratos. E quando esses pangolins chegam no centro, chegam num estado muito difícil de poder recuperar os animais. 
que temos feito é metermos o animal a um tratamento intensivo até que o animal recupere. Depois dele ficar bem, desenvolvemos o seu habitat natural. Until then, the team works tirelessly every day to nurse them back to health. Levamos eles todos os dias para alimentá-los durante duas a quatro horas. Por isso, faça sol, faça chuva, nós temos que garantir que os animais estejam sempre em boas condições de saúde. Nós trabalhamos com o auxílio dos fiscais, que nos ajudam a controlar os animais no período de alimentação e, para além disso, ajudam também no processo de abrir as árvores para que os animais encontrem seus alimentos com facilidade, também os buracos, se for num sítio duro. By taking pangolins out for feeding, Elias and his team ensures that their natural instincts remain intact after they are released back to the wild. This is crucial for their survival. When the pangolins come to a toca, the tendency is to farejar primeiro. Aquilo é uma forma de criar pressão e as formigas ficam agitadas lá embaixo. Quando tu abres com a a tendência de todas fugirem e recolher seus ovos. It's estimated that a single pangolin can consume up to 20,000 ants or termites a day, 70 million every year. That voracious appetite effectively regulates insect populations and safeguards the surrounding forest. Their digging also contributes to the cycling of nutrients in the soil and provides shelter for other creatures to rely on. É um animal extremamente importante para o meio ambiente. E se nós tivermos, se não tivermos a espécie de pangolim para poder regular a quantidade desta espécie no meio ambiente, estamos a perder de certa forma. Elias and his colleagues recognize that the key to safeguarding these animals lies with the communities who live beside with them. They are the ones who communicate with park authorities about pangolin situation close to where they live, helping to reduce the trafficking over the years. So nós convidamos pessoas especiais, que são as crianças, que são um vetor extremamente importante para a divulgação da informação nas comunidades. São pessoas que vivem ao redor da zona de Paulo. Então temos que eh, compartilhar com eles aquilo que nós fazemos no centro de reabilitação de pangolin. The effort to win hearts and minds appears to be having an impact. As pessoas já estão a ter conhecimento de que quando vemos o pangolim é para entregarmos o nosso centro de reabilitação. Uh, até então, o centro de reabilitação de pangolim já recebeu 101 pangolins, dos quais 80 provém do mercado ilegal da caça furtiva e 21 recebemos voluntariamente pela população que vive ao redor da zona tampão do Parque Nacional da Gorongoni. Eu me sinto feliz porque este é o resultado do trabalho que eu estou a fazer, do contributo que eu estou a dar na reabilitação desta espécie. In order to monitor their movements and well-being, 
Each pangolin is fitted with a GPS transmitter prior to its release. When I liberated a pangolin, I had a sentiment of felicity because, in a certain form, the mission ended. O que eu espero é que no futuro este problema de tráfico ilegal de pangolins se estanque, porque estancando esse mercado ilegal de pangolins, a nossa população de pangolins vai crescer e o nosso equilíbrio ecológico vai se estabilizar. Se estabilizando o nosso equilíbrio ecológico, as nossas comunidades vão ter o privilégio de ver os pangolins com maior frequência, nós estaremos a receber mais bênção. So I think we've gone over and I think it's time for lunch. I do just want to mention one last thing. So we are in development on season three. We are looking for story ideas. As we mentioned before, there's a lot of different models we can approach for, uh, for the next season. So if you have ideas, Jeff and I are around and um, would love to chat. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Us. yeah. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Ago. Um, and don't forget, everybody, lunch is served downstairs at the Lingela uh, restaurant. Music, thanks. Um, yeah, and we will see you back here straight after lunch. Don't be late. We've got some prizes. <laughs>
e mamíferos herbívoros na ciclagem de nutrientes nas plantas e no solo. Trabalho geralmente em campo com um estagiário. Dizer que é muito bom aprender, mas muito melhor é ensinando. Tenho uma hipótese que diz que nas áreas onde a presença de fogo e ao mesmo tempo passa o mamífero e herbívoro, as concentrações de nutrientes, carbono, nitrogênio, magnésio e outros elementos sejam maiores. Uma vez que os mamíferos, a partir dos, do seu excremento de fezes e urinas, eles aumentam o nitrogênio no solo e o fogo pode aumentar o carbono depois dele ter passado. Então, essas duas interações poderão nos dar mais, mais concentrações positivas nesse caso, nessa savana, uma vez que as savanas são geralmente a ecossistemas pobres em nutrientes. Então, com esses dois fatores podem, ao longo do tempo, a equilibrar. Quando eu vivia com minha avó, quase vivi com ela 10 anos. Eu aprendi muita coisa. Acordar, orar, até acho que 4 e 30. Depois das quatro, começar a caminhar. Quatro quilômetros, no Amachamba, lá em Ribal. Eu nem sabia que aquela, aquela área era uma savana, sabe? Então, ao longo da caminhada, ela tinha paciência de me ensinar cada tipo de planta e sua função. Apesar que ela não sabia o nome científico, mas ela sabia a função. Temos dois tratamentos, um de fogo e outro de herbivoria. Por exemplo, nessa área aberta aqui, há a entrada de herbívoros e temos aqueles, aquelas parcelas fechadas. Sim, sim. Ali não há entrada de herbívoros. Yeah, já está. Para o meu trabalho, eu sou, essas câmeras eu monto nas parcelas abertas, onde há a presença de herbívoros. Não, só um lá testar. Se está a ter arma. Mien que não tô ria ou soma. Mas só tem esse nirania erutua que ela quer na cano. Mien que não tô ria ou soma o eno ego. Eu tive um irmão com problemas mentais. Então, minha mãe passou por vários sítios para poder melhorar a capacidade de alimentar, de voltar ao normal, mas nem consegui. Eu comecei a pensar, e se eu estudasse é isso que eu estou a aprender aqui? Só me ensinar com minha avó para poder curar meu irmão. Então, foi daí que eu comecei a pensar em concorrer para fazer farmácia, porque acreditei que ele ia conseguir curar meu irmão. E foi daí. Eu pensei, meu, meu irmão perdeu a vida em 2015. Eu não quero ser cortada, mas quero ser podada para frutificar que os frutos sejam meus pais. Que os frutos sejam para minha cidade. Que os frutos sejam para o meu país. Preciso frutificar. Não. Leão. Leão. Eu sonhei com o Leão de ontem para hoje. E agora estamos aqui no campo, estamos a escutar o rugido dele. O que isso significa mesmo? Será que não será uma profetisa no futuro ou agora? Eu espero que o meu estudo seja mais importante para perceberem que esses dois fatores ajudarão a, a gestão da própria fauna, 
assim como a gestão do próprio parque. Depois de, deste estudo que eu estou a realizar, ao longo do tempo venham mais pessoas a testar mesmo as informações, provavelmente, porque ao longo de, do tempo a savana e outros fatores não são estáticos, nós poderemos ver mudanças. Então, essa ideia de sempre trazer mais informações, nova informação será importante não ser, é isso que a ciência nos, nos, nos coloca. A ciência não é estática, é dinâmica, cada vez mais temos que fazer pesquisa. Como mulher e como menina que saiu daquela, daquele distrito, distrito de Ribau, agora é município, eu quero servir como uma inspiração para as gerações que agora já estão a nascer naquela, naquele distrito, que tenham mais sonho a partir de, dessa, dessa minha presença agora, mostrando que é possível sonhar e chegar, mas temos que ser mais determinantes no que nós escolhemos. Muito bom escrever a nossa própria história. Musiro para a tia na Makua. Munira mpanta o etonye rango o tia na. Musiro unkapelela orera wangu o lumunguni mu. Mika Clementina, Kamakua, Mika Cientista. Incredible, incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for sharing that beautiful work. We've seen number three, we've seen number two, we've seen number one. Um, we'll be going into our next session, which is grant writing tips and techniques, um, which when I asked how to pronounce his name, he said Uncle Paul. Um, but we have, I would like to welcome to the stage Paul Nulu, Lerato Mohuatle and uh, Kirote Kome, please, uh, to take over. Also, the clicker is on the table on the left. Yes. Yeah, then. Ah, uh, okay. okay. The, mic the microphone. Hello, Nuf. Hello, Nuf. It's good to see you guys. It's good to be here. Uh, this is my second time at NUF, and the energy uh, that I feel in the room is always amazing. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Nkirote and Lerato will join me later. When we, we planned this, uh, Pragna wanted me to do a master class, which was a four hour grand writing master class. And I was scared, really scared. Uh, but eventually we agreed to cut it down. I'll, I'll talk about grant writing for about the first hour. Uh, and then I'll invite uh, Nkirote uh, Lerato to come up so they can also, they work, they are funders. And you can actually hear from funders that are funding work in the continent, in the region. So you can be able to know and have more options on how you can apply. Uh, they always say that the worst time for a speaker to speak is after lunch or after a good speech. Now, I'm fighting with after lunch and after a good movie. So I think I'm like probably in the worst shape. Uh, but I hope we can be able to make this engaging, make this fun. I did bring a deck because I'm going to be talking a lot about grant making, so I have a lot of things I'm going to be passing on to you. I will leave the deck with Newf and they can be able to share that information with you. So I am Paul Wolo. I work with National Geographic Society as a senior director of storytelling programs. And uh, I am one of those that have the immense privilege of working with NEWF, which is why I'm here. So today, 
I'm really going to talk about my experience as a producer and as a grant writer. What I have learned over the years. I started as an academician before I went into uh, working in philanthropy. So I've written grants both as an academician and also as a filmmaker. So I think I've gotten some experience over the last decade of doing that. And one thing I want to start with is to say that if you have not failed as a grant writer, you have not started as a grant writer. Seriously. Because there is just so little resources out there and so many people looking for those resources that uh, your chances of getting a grant the first time you go out is probably not very high. So please, one thing you can take away from this is that you need to be seriously encouraged and seriously working hard to be able to get your grant. If there's one thing you take away from this session today, I hope you take away more, but if there's one thing you take away is that you need to be really, really encouraged and really, really work hard. So, what's a grant? A grant is really non-repayable funds. It doesn't mean it's free money. It's funds that you don't have to repay. However, it's disbursed by a grant maker, which is often a foundation, a trust. And their goal for giving you that fund is that they give it to a grant seeker or a re recipient for an individual purpose. They give you that money so you can be able to do something. So it's not just, here, take the money. They give it to you because they have a purpose in mind. And that purpose is often the purpose that furthers the goal of the funder. Nobody gives you money because you look good or because they like you. No. They give you money because they have a mission that they are trying to accomplish. And your project has to help them accomplish that mission. And I'm going to talk about alignment later on. So for you to get that money, you often have to write a grant proposal. Again, no matter how good you speak, you cannot just go and speak to a funder and they give you money. You have to be able to put your thoughts down on paper. You have to be able to write something cogent, something that is convincing enough to make that fund that give you money. So that's how, why you write a grant proposal. So, in essence, who gives grants? You have foundations and trusts, nonprofits like National Geographic Society, like all the different foundations out there. Governments also give grants. We saw the lady from the KZN Film Commission, that's kind of part of a government agency that gives grants. You have community organizations. In some communities, you have some groups that have resources that they can be able to use to fund some projects. And then corporates. Some corporations, as part of their corporate social responsibility, do give grants. So MTN, uh, all of those kind of companies have a corporate social responsibility arm that they can also use to be able to fund some of your projects. Who gets grants? Individuals, filmmakers, individuals that are working on projects get grants. Many funders prefer to give grants to organizations more than individuals. One thing that makes Nagio very interesting is that Nagio is the biggest funder of individual storytellers in the world. Nagio doesn't like to give grants to organizations, especially for their storytelling work. We trust the individuals who are our, our explorers, and we give them those resources. Even in instances where the individual doesn't have a structure, we can give the money to like a university with the explicit direction that that resource will go through the university, through to the individual. Then we have what I call fiscal sponsors. You're a filmmaker, you want to make a film. And you, you've done it for 10 years, but it's just Paul Mulu Productions. Probably not registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission of my city. I don't have a big team backing me. But the fund that doesn't want to give money to Paul Mulu Productions. You can find a fiscal sponsor. A fiscal sponsor is often an organization that has the structure already set up. 
their structure aligns with the work that you're doing. And you can go to the fiscal sponsor and say, let's partner on this grant. And normally how that works is that you probably do all the work, they get the money on your behalf, and they keep 10% or some percentage that you agree upon. That way you can get the money to do your work. The group funding you can trust well enough that they're giving a reputable group the money and then the work gets done. So that's where that fiscal sponsorship comes in. As I wanted to add that there, for most of you that have ideas and feel like you can't get that funding based on your own profile alone, you can always look for a fiscal sponsor that can enable you to get that resource. Again, as you do that, always remember that get a fiscal sponsor again that aligns with what you're doing. If you're doing a film about wildlife, don't go and get a hospital to be a fiscal sponsor. Find an NGO that's working on wildlife because your missions align and as such will also align with the mission of the funder. Then timelines. Most groups that fund projects adhere to a strict timeline so the earlier you start the better. Find out the financial year of the funding organization. When I used to work with a big funder, we used to say that if you hit us in the first quarter of the year, your chance of getting money is much higher than when you come in the third quarter. Because we ran a financial year of January to December. And as a grant maker, I had benchmarks to be able to meet. So the earlier you come in the year, the more I'll be able to listen to you. If you, are st if you start coming by August, September, even if you have a good idea, my budget at that time was pretty much done. So again, find out the funding, the financial year of the funder and hit it early enough in the year when they still have money, when they are still willing to listen to ideas. So those are kind of the grant making process. Again, the types of grant support that you can apply, again, most of you are going to be going for project support, but it's also important to understand the different grants that you can be able to apply for. You can have what are called operating or general support grants. And these are normally given to organizations. And they're given by funders with a free reign for the organization to use any way they want to use. So it can help you pay rent. It can help you train your staff. It can help you do anything you need to do to keep the organization going. Most of the times, as an organization, if you get a grant, many funders will add maybe 20% of your grant as general support. That way, even after you've done the project, you are still able to keep the lights on. You're still able to pay the other bills you need to pay. Then you have your project support. These are those funds that are specifically directed to you completing your project. Again, as creatives and filmmakers, most of what you get is going to be general support grants. Now, I say filmmakers and creatives, but I also know that we have scientists, conservationists as new fellows. Some of this will apply, but I come from a creative background, and most of my work is around creativity and storytelling. So my presentation feels more towards that than towards the science and conservation side. But you still gain a lot from this. Then you have capacity building which again is the grants you get to go and build your capacity. Go to workshops, go to editing workshops, go to writing workshops, different things you do to be able to build yourself in your craft so you can excel. Then we have capital equipment support. They can give you money to go and buy cameras, update your studio. Those are often more difficult to get, especially if you're working with a US funder. Because as a US funder, you have to de depreciate capital investments over a period of time. One of the challenges you always had was that when you gave a filmmaker money to buy a camera, the rule says that that asset has to be depreciated over an almost seven year period. That filmmaker has finished their film the first year, they will write a report for you. Second year, they will write a report, their grant has finished, you did not renew the grant. There's no motivation for them to continue writing that report. And by the third year, the fourth year, when they're supposed to give you a report so you can depreciate the asset, they're no longer there. And then you fall afoul 
in your organization because you're no longer able to report on that. So many funders might not give you money for capital equipment in the work that you do. There are other ways that we used to manage this process. For example, I can say you are a filmmaker. You need to use a red camera for your project. Now, you can go and rent a red camera for a 50-day shoot. Let's say you need to shoot for 50 days. Renting that red camera for 50 days is going to probably cost you more than it will to buy a new red. So I can indirectly agree with you. It won't be documented there. And I'm saying this with my boss here, but I don't make grants for Nigeria, so I can say this. I'm sharing my experience now. You can indirectly agree with the filmmaker. Go and buy that red camera. Rent it to yourself and do your film. When you finish, you have a red camera to continue your work. And everybody's happy. You don't have to report to me for seven years. So there are innovative ways that you can be able to come around this. But the goal is that the funder wants you to succeed. So he or she is willing to work with you to find ways for you to succeed. Then you have your planning and research support grants. Those are normally small grants that you give that enables you to plan and do research. I know Africa No Filter is here. They do what I call KKRA grants, and I know Lerat is going to talk about it. Small grants that enable you to be able to do your research, write a proposal, do the different things you need to do to set up. And then you have your awards, fellowships, and residencies. Most of you here are new fellows. Even though you don't get cash, it's still an award. It's a grant you get that privilege of being a new fellow can be considered as a grant. So those of you that are fellows have already succeeded in getting one grant. So you're way ahead of some of us. Yeah? So before you begin a grant, there are several questions you really need to ask yourself to make sure that this is what you want to do. First, what is your mission and your vision? Understand what you're trying to do. Understand why you're trying to do it. Be committed to that mission and vision. Don't just look at a grant as something I want to go and do because I want money. If you do that, you would not succeed. Be very committed because the process of getting that grant calls for a lot of commitment and passion from your side. So understand what is your mission. And understanding your mission and vision also enables you to be able to align it with the mission and vision of the funder. Next thing is that what is your goal for the funding? Why do you want to use the funding? You have to be able to identify that very well. Why do you think the grant is a good fit for you? Some filmmakers struggle with the fact that, and I'm going to tell you this, if you are asking for a grant, chances that you are going to change your idea a little bit almost 100 percent because a funder would not just give you money say go and do whatever you want to do the funder again has goals so understand if i don't want to change my story a little bit maybe i don't need a grant i can look for someone to commission me i can do crowdfunding so make sure that the grant is the best way to be able to do this who are your target beneficiaries and how will they benefit from this project you have to identify that. You have to be able to say, okay, when I do this project, I'm not the target. The funder is not the target. There is a secondary audience that this will influence. Maybe I'm trying to change policy. Maybe I'm trying to change awareness. Identify who will be the end impact of the content you're creating. Do I have solid systems in place? If you're an organization, do you have an accounting department? Do you have a process? Even if you're an individual, can you manage money? If somebody gives you $100,000 today to say go and do a project, can you manage it? It's a lot of money. Be truthful to yourself and realize that I have a budget, I have ideas, and I'm going to make sure that this money does it for me. So ask yourself that question. Next, do you have the skills needed to complete this project? Again, as a filmmaker, there are some certain skills you need. You don't need to be an excellent sound person. You don't need to be a wonderful photographer or cinematographer. But you need to understand the concept of producing your film. What does it take to create that film? 
What does it take to hire the best cinematographer? What does it take to hire the best director? Those are what I mean by the basic skills that will help you to be able to deliver on the project. Are you or the organization willing to do what it takes to get the grant and the requirements that come with getting the grant? Again, you have to do a lot to get the grant. If most grants, most funders require you to submit like a five-year financial statement. They require you to bring a lot of documents that they know that, that they can use to evaluate you. So are you willing to provide all of those documents? And then what are your challenges and your successes? Be able to understand what have I dealt with and how will what I've dealt with help me in succeeding? Understand if you're working in a country where you need permits to go and work, will it be possible for me to get those permits? I'm from Nigeria. I've done a lot of work in Nigeria. Most of you know what Kane is. Who knows what Kane is? Kane is a process that allows you to be able to bring equipment into a country when you're shooting. So if I'm coming from USA to shoot in South Africa, I can get a, get a Kane. And the Kane will enable me to bring any equipment in here, pay a little bit of deposit, do my shoot, and take it back out. Nigeria doesn't accept Kane. So if I'm a producer and I'm in the US looking for a grant to go and do a film in Nigeria, I know that's a challenge for me. Because I have to find another way to get my equipment inside there, do my job and leave. So articulate your challenges so you can be prepared with those challenges. So alignment, one thing that makes a grant successful is alignment. You are the first part of that process. The funder is the second part of that process. And the issue is the third part of that process. All of those three have to be aligned before you can be able to get the money. If two out of three are aligned, you're not going to get the money. So again, that's what I mean by understanding your mission so you can align with the funder's mission and then the issue that the funder wants to support. Issue can be cyclical. In Nacho, every time we do a call out, we have some specific call outs we do. We have a fresh water initiative that we are working on now. So the issue is about fresh water. So we, we might do a call out on that. If you are working on lions, lions will not align with fresh water. So even if you are an explorer, which is you have aligned with the funder, that issue is a side that's missing. So always make sure that you have these three alignments before you start going for a grant. Okay, keep in mind, funders prefer to fund organizations they are familiar with, as well as those that have an established record of success. If you have not won many grants, try partnering with those that have won grants. It's the reality. Again, funders prefer to fund those that they know and they trust can be able to deliver on the work. It's not a good thing to say, but it's the reality. So as you do this, that also means that you have to be able to try and build relationships with those funders. Look for opportunities that will get you in front of a funder. That might mean volunteering for an organization that the funder already funds. I have a couple of examples. Again, in my prior place of employment, when we had somebody like our CEO visiting, we invited other grantees to come in. And a few of the times, the grantees will call, will tell me, Paul, can we bring a camera person to come and record our interaction with the grantee? And they bring the camera person. That person is there. And then that person will pull me aside and say, by the way, Paul, this is what I do. And they'll give me their card, or they'll give me some samples of the work they've done. That way, when they now reach out to me for a grant, I've met them. I know that at least they are active in the field and it's easier for me to start considering them. So again, part of this is that try to know the funders funding work in your area. Try anything possible, find out where do they go. Is there like a philanthropy luncheon? Is there things that, they, if, do they come to Durban Film Festival? Register, pay money and go to the film festival. Do they come to New Congress? Find out ways to come. 
When you come to Congress, go to Noel and say, this is who I am. I want to be able to meet this. Can you help me do that? That way you create relationships and that will help you in your grant seeking. And when you haven't done that, partner with others. Okay, so your grant writing process. Time is flying too much. I want to hasten up a little bit. So I'll, I'll go faster. You're going to get these decks, but I'll go faster. So when you write your plan, your grant, the first thing is to plan. Plan, research, document the unmet needs. Document interesting way to address those needs. I always say that there is no fresh problem in the world today. Every problem has been, ex has been explored. Just find different ways to explore that problem and be unique in your proposal. Research. Look for the right fit. Look for the right problem. Look for the right funder. Look for a win-win approach. Most of us that apply for grants think about what is the need for me first. Think about what is the need for me and the funder collaboratively. Every grant process should be a win-win process. Not one where I win 70%, they win 30%. No, it should be an equal process. Then write. When you're writing your grant, remember that you are a storyteller. Do not bore the grant reader with data and statistics. That might be helpful for a science grant, but it's not helpful for a storytelling grant. Tell stories, use your words to be able to evoke a feeling that will make that funder say, okay, I need to look at this a little bit more. If you need to use prose, use prose. Again, just know that you're writing as a creative storyteller. And finally, follow up. Follow ups are important. Even if you don't get the grant, follow up. Because again, following up allows you to say, what did I do wrong? What did I, what can I do the next time around? So again, allows you to be able to strengthen that relationship. Okay, what funders are looking for quickly? Need, you need to identify the need. You need to present a solution to the need. You need to be able to prove that you are, you are, your approach or your solution will solve that need. You need to be able to say, this is why I'm the best person for you to fund. You need to be confident enough to say, my approach is the best and I can deliver on this approach. So this is why you bring your filmography. This is where you bring the things you have done before. Send samples of your work. Do everything that you can do to convince that funder that you are the best person and the best investment that they can do. And then sustainability. <coughs> Funders hate to fund you for one project and then you disappear. So again, in your proposal writing, talk about how you are going to continue having impact in the area, even if they don't fund you anymore. So how you are, after making the film, you continue impact. You continue with the experience the film I've made. I'll use it for communities continuing, and I'll, I'll even go and train young people based on the time I've done in this film. You can even say, I'll bring young people in as my crew when I'm shooting, because by empowering those young people, you are creating sustainability. And funders love to fund sustainability. So put that in your proposal. Okay, finally, I want to get into looking at what every creative should have on their grant proposal. Should always have a log line. What's a log line? Most of you are creative. So what's a log line? Yes. One sentence. Exactly. One sentence. Okay, maybe two if you have a wonderful story. But as short as possible, that summarizes what you're trying to do. Go online. Look for log lines. Google them. Read them. There is a site that has 250 log lines from different movies. Use online as a resource to do these things. Then your story summary, again, very brief summary of the story you're trying to tell, the film you're trying to make, the photo essay you're trying to do, st st you know, small enough, 500 to 1,000 words, an artistic approach that you're going to use. Are you going to do a documentary, an animation? Are you going to do, you know, what is your style? And why is that style the best way to be able to tell that story? 
you look at your director's statement, who is the director? Who will you bring in to direct this work? And again, what is their motivation to work on this? Are you the director? Don't have to be. But the director is an essential piece of that production. Because is, is they're the one that will translate your vision. So you need to be able to put the director's vision. I'm going to be bringing XYZ as my director. This is what he or she has done, and this is their vision to create content that will drive change. You put that there for the funder. Your project stage, what stage are you on the project? If you are beginning, let them know. If you have to raise funds from multiple sources, let them know. Many people make that mistake of saying, okay, I'm going to apply to multiple. It's okay to apply to multiple funders, but be truthful about your stage and where you are. Because you don't want a funder to be interested and you say, okay, I asked for $50,000 and thank you very much. But by the way, I need another 50, so I'm going to keep your money while I look for another 50. Unless they've written that check, they probably pulled their money back. So be honest about the stage you are in your production. Your audience and strategy for distribution. Funders don't just want films to be made. They want people to see the film that you make. And most funders will not have the time to distribute. So talk about how you're going to distribute it. Have an impact plan built into your proposal. Say, this is what I'm going to do. This is the impact I'm trying to have. I want this to lead to policy change in KwaZulu Natal province around this issue. And when this film is done, I'm going to have a premiere where I invite all the councilmen and women from KwaZulu Natal. And we can have a one day seminar where we show the film and invite academicians to talk about the XYZ issue. So they can, we can engage them to lead policy. So talk about your plan for distribution. Talk about your key creative personnel. Who is your camera person? The funder might not know the camera person, but put them in there and say what they have done. If you say that you're working with a camera person that's done several films that won awards, I'm more interested. Because I want my, the film I found to be an award-winning film. So indicate your creative personnel. And then financial information. It's not about the film at this point. That's not the film budget. That's more about your own financial information. What have you done? How many other projects of similar budgets have you done? If you are applying for an organization, what is your annual budget? Again, a fund that wants to know that they are not giving you more money than you can be able to handle. If you've received two or three ten thousand dollar grants and you manage them well, then you come for a five hundred thousand dollar grant. The fund is going to look at it to be more realistic. So again, always put out that financial information. Then you have a summary budget. When you submit your grant proposal, don't give a full budget unless the funder asks for it. Have your full budget standing by when they ask, send it. But just do a summary budget, five or six lines at the most. Personnel, crew, how many days I'm shooting, travel. Just keep it short, your summary budget but prepare a full budget that you can send in because sometimes they will require for the full budget. And I'll talk about budget in the next slide. Then visual samples of your work. What have you done before? Put the link on, your, the, link on the website. Put password if it's Vimeo, YouTube protected. Put those things there. Some people actually ignore most of these things. Don't just put a link because some links might not work. The funder might be reading it when they're not connected to the internet. So clicking on the link might not work. So just put, type in the URL, type in the password, and still put a link. You want to make that process easier. And then your contact information. You won't believe how many people make this mistake, where they will put their contact information in one page, and then not on the rest. If you say in, in your proposal for the 12 pages, have a footer that has your email your phone number, so the funder can be able to, doesn't have to look for how to reach out to you. Always keep that in mind. Okay, so let's look at, I think, budgets. Okay, just quickly, budgets, do's, and don'ts. Nothing kills grants more than budgets. Budgets are about money. And people don't trust others when it comes to money. I'm sorry to say that. 
but that's the truth. So when you are creating your budget, there are some certain best practices and worst practices. One, understand the importance of budget in your proposal. You can have a good idea, a fundable idea, but the money you put there is too much. That has defeated your purpose. So let the work align with how much money that you're asking. Read the grant application and follow all rules on the budget. The grant application will always tell you this is what we are willing to fund and what we are not willing to fund. If they say we don't fund equipment, don't go and start putting how many lights and cameras you're going to buy because that disqualifies you. So read and follow the budget guidelines especially. Make sure that all elements in the budget should be based on project needs. Don't say, I'm going to hire a helicopter to go and shoot something when you are shooting in downtown Johannesburg. Realistic about what you're putting in there. If you can use a drone, use a drone. If you're doing a shot that is within an area where a drone can get up, then you put money about renting a helicopter. That defeats your purpose. So let everything align. Provide budget justification, especially for things that stand out. Provide budget justification. I had an instance where, again, when I was working in Nigeria, I was funding someone that had to go to do some work in northern Nigeria where uh, Boko Haram issue was very strong at that point. And they needed to stay in a hotel. Now, I know that in the city in northern Nigeria, the most expensive hotel is going to be about $25 a night. But that person seeking for funding provided putting $100 a night for a hotel. But they indicated in there that they're going to stay in the UN sanctioned hotel that has the best security because of the crisis of Boko Haram. And that justified it. Because I don't want them to go to any hotel and be attacked. They needed to be in a safe hotel. So I was able to approve that $100 a night based on that justification. So when you put things that are going to raise eyebrows, explain it to the funder. Then pay yourself. You don't want starving artists, though. Seriously, many people feel like, okay, if I don't pay myself, then they will think I'm more responsible. No. No. As you do your budget, build in how much you're going to pay yourself because you are using your intellectual prowess. This is the skill that you have received through training. This is how you feed your family if you have a family. So build that in, but build it in responsibly. And I'll talk about that later on. So don't overlook the importance of having a logical and rational budget. Include items that are not, do not include items that are not specifically requested in the grant application. Do not lump all your expenses together. Again, as I said, itemize. Uh, do not forget to recheck and recalculate your numbers before submitting. Another big mistake people make. Use Excel. Or if you don't use Excel, get your calculator. Check, recheck. Because again, you know, you don't look good when you submit something and I'm calculating it as a funder and it doesn't align. So it just is again a very common mistake, just like spelling mistakes and all those other ones. And then do not spend more on yourself. Even though you're paying yourself, don't pay yourself 70% that you started to be able to do the project. Balance is important. Okay, then finally, there are other things you need to keep in mind. You might need to submit, if you're working for, if you're applying with an organization, you might need to submit a lot of documentation. Some of the organizations, legal requirements, registration, board list, all those things that make you look reputable, be ready to submit it to the funder. Reference and support letters are very important, especially if it's your first time going for a grant. Find people that will send you a reference letter to attach to the grant. Again, this comes from volunteering. If you worked as a volunteer for a project, if you worked as a crew member, if you're a member of NUF uh, and you're going to apply for a grant somewhere else, talk to Uncle Noel, talk to Pragna, and say, I'm applying for this grant. Please, can you recommend me? Write a letter of recommendation for me to attach. All of those things, again, 
make the founder understand that you, that you didn't just come out from the street, that you are a repeatable somebody. Press mentions, if you have done work that was showcased and highlighted in different areas, put them out there. So again, they know you have a profile. <coughs> if you have a group, again, have a repeatable board. That's very important. If you're going to apply with an organization, find out who their board members are. Because if I'm looking at that group and I have their board members, I see people that I respect, and I know these are people that are important, then I'll be much more amenable to supporting that group. Then finally, follow up. If you are one of the lucky few that get the grant, follow up. Send an email. I appreciate the person. Because it's not an easy process. Review and be comfortable with the terms, and this is very important. Once a funder has agreed to give you a grant, you can still negotiate terms with them. Remember again, this is your intellectual property. Most funders, especially non-profit funders, will enable you to keep the rights of your work. Make sure you get that in the grant agreement or whatever you sign with them, because it's your work. It's your idea. It's your thinking. If you are not comfortable with the terms, please walk away from the grant. I know it's hard to say that after you've done all this work, but there are other things that will come up. Instead of soiling your own reputation or doing something that you will not be happy with. You can still make some slight adjustments. Once the fund is done, you're already in. <coughs> the fund that doesn't want to start over again. At that point, they are willing to negotiate with you on some of the things that they can give and get. Be responsive and responsible. Respond to their mails. <coughs> Answer their questions. Do what you need to do to keep that relationship good. Deliver as promised and keep the funder informed if anything changes. Life does change. So if you need an extension, you need to do something else, just keep that dialogue open with your funder. If the answer is no, it's not personal. Don't go and suck and go into your room and start crying. <laughs> it's not personal. You are probably one of many that they've received their things and they can only say yes to so many. So take it as a learning experience. If possible, find out why. You can wait a week and then tell the funder, Would you, is it okay for me to have a, a chat with you to find out what I can do better the next time? Not to find out why you rejected me, because if you tell me that, I'll, I'll run away. <laughs> yes, but if you say, I want to find out how can I improve? How can I do better the next time? Then they're willing to talk to you. And just take it as that. Ask about future opportunities. Ask them, when can I reapply? Do you have other calls that are going to be out there? Can you refer me to another group that is funding similar work? Engage the funder. And finally, don't suck. Move on. It's just a stumbling block along the road. Move on and go to the next one. Before I bring my two colleagues in, I want to talk a little bit about National Geographic. Most of you know this already. We are the biggest funder of individual storytellers. And that's the website that you can go to find out our grants <coughs> when we're about to fund. Our mission is there, using the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And then what we fund, we fund work around oceans, land, wildlife, histories, and cultures, and human ingenuity. <laughs> Most of you that apply for grants the first time will apply as a level one grantee. Level one is almost what we call our talent agency. That's how we bring people in to the organization. And that's often maximum $20,000 grants. Now once you get a level one, you can also apply for level two. You can still apply for level two as your first grant. But your chances are better as a level one than they are as a level two. So just be realistic in your application. And then if you get our grant, you become an explorer. All of our grantees are explorers. 
And as an explorer, you not only get the financial support, you also get additional support. You get training, you get networking, you get a chance to be able to meet with other explorers. And you get uh, training on things like how do I market myself, social media. So there's a lot more that comes with the funding that you get in society. So again, uh, I'm here, you know, through this week. Caitlin is here, Dan is here. Feel free to talk to us. I've already had one on ones with about 30 of you so far to talk about Naju and what we fund. Keep coming. I'll keep talking to you guys and encouraging you. But again, go to our website to read more about what we fund. Now, I'm going to invite Nkirote. Nkirote works with uh, Luminate Group. They are a founder of content out of Nairobi, but they fund work in South Africa and around the region to talk about Luminate and what they fund. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nkirote and I work with Luminate. I had the pleasure of working with Paul in pre his previous employer. Um, I don't know why he's shy to mention it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we used to work together at the Ford Foundation. And now I work at Luminate as a grant maker. And what that means is my role involves sourcing, evaluating, and executing opportunities. And Paul really gave you the rundown of how philanthropy works, which is basically how Luminate works. But there are a few differences. Luminate is what we call, it's a relatively young foundation. It was started in 2018 unlike others that have been around for 100 years, 75 years, 60 years. So like any five-year-old, we are very risk-loving. And <laughs> we tend to go towards opportunities that can be big bets, opportunities that may not be as successful, but do have the potential to change how things are done. So a little history about Luminate. Luminate is part of a group of philanthropic organizations that are part of the Omidia Group. The Omidia Group is a group of about 10 to 15 foundations based in different parts of the world that have a benefactor, one single benefactor, and this is the Omidia family. So they have you know, a very generous spirit and support each and every one of the different philanthropic entities to do what they do. So at Luminate, we are primarily a core funder. And what that means is we give a lot of institutional support. Paul spoke about project funding, which is something that we do. But we go towards more um, institutional funding because we believe in the power of creating sustainable, long-lasting, impactful organizations. And one of the ways you do that is through core funding. What is core funding? Core funding is simply money that is without restrictions. So you receive the grant and you're able to use it to pay rent, to pay um, your administration staff that may not be necessarily linked to the project, to pay for training, to pay for team building, to pay for projects, to pay for tea and other things that project costs may not cover. So that's a little bit about Luminate. And now I'll go into what we fund and what we look for in what we fund. And Paul was quite um, detailed in his explanation in explaining what uh, philanthropic donors look for in funding, which is pretty much the same thing Luminate looks for. The first thing is strategic alignment. As Luminate, we have two strategic priority areas. The first one being healthy information ecosystems and the second one on participation and dissent. So I'll talk a little bit about them and then you'll see how we fund film through those areas. So the first thing that we do is uh, looking at healthy information ecosystems. And that is ways in which the news media evolves. Luminate has a strong history of funding independent media, and that's what we do. We look at the whole value chain of media from the source to the sink. And part of that is looking at and supporting media that's inclusive, that's diverse, that is taking account and bringing to the front nuanced perspectives, media that is challenging the status quo, and also new media initiatives. Currently, we're experimenting with you know, trying to see how we can make viable business models for media and podcasting and different other things. Then the other thing that we work on is participation and dissent. 
And this is for us in the Africa team. What we look at is trying to support more civic and political participation of young people and women and creating safe spaces for people to dissent. So from the sounds of it, Luminate is an impact funder. So what that means is that we look for impact in everything that we fund because the impact has to be tied to our strategic priorities. How we use narrative change or filmmaking or moving images is as a lever to push forward our messages. So I'll give you an example. We funded a film called Softy, which was a documentary about a young person who was running for political office in Kenya. It was following this gentleman called Boniface Mwangi, who's an activist, who was running for uh, MP in one of the constituencies in Nairobi. The story actually was one about, a very tender story about the sacrifice and the toll it takes on family. But this film, was showcasing that it is possible for young people to run for office in a country where the cost of political involvement is so high for most people, it's prohibitive. So we were using that film as a way to show that even if you don't have much, even if you don't come from a prominent family, you still can do it and look, someone actually has. And they didn't win, but they caused ripples in that. So that just goes to show you, you don't have to be a winner when you're coming to Luminate. You just have to have a good idea and a bunch of other things that Paul said that I'll also repeat in a different way. So that's how we use film. The other films that we're using um, are tied to the same um, political, civic and, polit and political participation. We are currently supporting a documentary of a lady called Umra who ran for office in Kenya. She's the first woman from her community to do so. Unfortunately, she didn't make it, but again, her story is one of inspiration. The other thing we look for, so I've spoken about strategic alignment, then I'll speak about budget. And we cannot stress this enough. Transparent and honest finances are so important to us because we are accountable to our benefactor. We are accountable to the tax services that we we, we, we are operating in, and we are also accountable to you as our community and as people who are receiving benefits from us or people who we are engaging with. So we are really keen on ensuring that what you submit to us presents an accurate and honest description of your organization. And as Paul said, if you do not have the capacity to do so, it's okay to work with an intermediary. We actually have supported a lot of intermediaries, some of whom are here, uh, like Africa No Filter, like DocuBox, and these organizations have the same mandate as some of the storytellers, and they're able to engage in a meaningful, impactful relationship that supports you as a creative in advancing your story. Uh, I had prepared some notes because I thought I was going to be up there. <laughs> So just let me refer to them a little bit. Um, the other thing that we look for is risks. This is something we have to do. Uh, one of the things that we look out for is um, what is the risk in funding your project? And just because you have a risk doesn't mean we won't fund you. This is how Creative Luminate is. We will work to mitigate that risk and we'll tell you, this is what we're sensing, how are you going to solve for it? And do you, need, uh, do you need beyond the dollar support to solve for it? So Luminate has what is called partner support. So we have these uh, services that we offer. Once you get your grant, you are eligible to get additional capacity building services to solve for that risk. And one of the things that we've noticed when we support creatives is there is a risk in institutional capacity. This means that HR, you know, accounting, finance, admin, those things generally don't get as much attention as storytelling, as crew, as equipment. So we try to make sure that we are giving the organization and the people involved in creating that story wholesome support. So just because a risk has been identified, don't be afraid, ask and let us know how can we solve for that risk. Then the other thing that uh, we look out for and we stress, and I myself have a personal interest in, is marketing and communications. We, when we were doing Softy, one, as much as it was a great story, one of the things that we were asking is, what next? You have this great film, how are people gonna know about it? And what are you gonna do about it? 
And then that started our entry into impact campaigns. And we learned a lot from it. There's the impact campaigns for the Oscars to get on the long list and all that, and that's amazing. It has all these razzmatazz and you know, and it's a very expensive campaign to run. But there's the other side of the impact campaign. That's the side of working with civil society organizations, working with communities who are also mission aligned as your story. By working with you know, small grassroots, politically uh, savvy and active organizations, Softy was shown in social justice organizations in low-income areas in Kenya, and people started discussing about the possibility of them running for office. Same thing with um, what we hope to do with Umrah once it's complete. We're hoping that you know, films like Umrah can spur people to have these conversations. And the civil society action, uh, organizations that work with these projects, that work with these films, can use that as content to you know, have outreach engagements, to have um, content to use when they're reaching out. And in a way, I believe it kind of keeps the film or whatever it is that you're promoting kind of evergreen because it's constantly in conversation and it's constantly being used to inculcate a new way of thinking. So that's us as Luminate. And we really, oh, then the last thing I forgot to mention was about budget. Something Paul didn't mention is that for some funders and Luminate being one of them, there's usually rules around budget. And at Luminate, we have a rule that we don't want to fund 100% um, of a project. The reason we avoid this is because we don't want to be the sole person looking after this project. We're, it's not sustainable that way. Saying Kirote leaves Luminate and or Luminate changes its strategic direction. Who else are you going to turn to to support your project? We really encourage that you have a diverse pool of funders to avoid all these changes that I just mentioned. So at Luminate, our rule is we usually don't fund more than 30% of the project cost. So mathematically, if your project is 100,000, we'll usually come in at 30,000. But there are some rules that can be bent. The rule for 30% applies to institutional funding, if we are funding your organization. But if we are funding your project, then the percentage can go a bit higher because we view projects as one-off funding or a one-off thing that may not necessitate deep, sustained relationships with the organization. So for here, we can go as high, and I've done some for like 40%, 45%. Uh, I've done one, I think, at 100%, but that was in special circumstances where we were funding the project entirely, but we have done one at 100%. That was just one. I don't know if we're going to do it again. Um, but there is some flexibility in projects. And from my experience, a lot of the films that we've supported, not just Softy, Umrah, there are others my colleagues have supported in Latin America, the territory, and others, they do have that um, flexibility and we can go higher. So there is some rules that are fixed, but there's always an opportunity to keep the conversation going. One thing we really value is communication. We understand that as creatives, you may have different priorities or different projects, but please, please, please keep us informed. Transparency, accountability, and communication are so key for us as we move forward. Because Paul didn't let you know, and one of the things we do is we also have to tell your story. When you come to us with a great idea, a great story, yes, I am the grant maker, Yes, I will execute the deal, but I also have to tell your story to the budget approvers. I also have to make a case for your story. I also have to act in support and as an advocate for your story. And to do that, I need the backing of your finances. I need the backing of your creativity, which is not in question because you're all here. I need the backing of your presence and your dedication and accountability to this. So I'm here. I'm open for questions, open for conversations. Um, and I'm happy as the conversation flows to give a bit more, uh, what do you call it, um, 
to give you more ideas on some of the projects that we're thinking about, some of the ways we can fund. Luminate is a bit different in the sense that we're not just a storytelling funder for the sake of storytelling. All your storytelling has to be linked to our strategic goals and it has to be linked to impact. So we're an impact funder, but we really, really do believe in the power of storytelling and I'm really grateful for you to listen, for you listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Nkirote. Uh, next, we have uh, Lerato from Africa No Filter. I believe she's no stranger here. She's been here before, uh, but she'll talk about what they found in Africa No Filter. Thank you so much. I'm just going to move a little bit away from the light. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lerato Mokwatle. I'm from Africa No Filter. And um, our story is one of my favorite stories to tell. In 2019, a Ford Foundation in their various offices across the African continent, wanted to work on a mutual project, something that could really connect the individual offices because they have their individual mandates. The result was that um, the various offices across the continent nominated storytellers, and they were given funding to tell the story of their life. It was a diverse group of storytellers. There was a playwright, there was a media publisher, there was an architectural photographer who embarked on a beautiful journey from Kenya to, to Maputo to archive African cities beyond DK. And um, there was a novelist and a few other people. And the outcome of that endeavor was so successful that Ford and a group of other funders, including Luminate, um, came together and decided to form a donor collaborative called Africa No Filter. This was launched in 2020. From the onset, we were clear what our vision was. We are shifting stereotypical narratives of Africa. We recognize that the story of Africa tends to typically be framed through corruption, poverty, disease, conflict, and poor leadership. These frames are limiting. As we all know, the story of Africa is not just the story of stereotypes. So what we do at Africa No Filter is support storytellers who are telling better stories about Africa and telling African stories better. That means storytellers who offer a new, exciting, fresh storylines about Africa, one that does not lead to the perception and the misconception of Africa. Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness. I can't. I'm as blind as a bat. My, my glasses are decorative. <laughs> oh yes. I'll try, I'll try. So, um, so then what, let me get back on track. So what we found is that through the stereotypical framing of narrative, um, through the stereotypical framing of Africa, the perception it creates is that Africa is a broken continent, that um, we are a dependent continent, and that Africans lack the agency to innovate our own solutions and create alternative realities for ourselves. And so we decided that we would fund storytelling. We fund individual storytellers, but we also fund arts, culture, and media organizations. And the golden thread that binds everyone together, we have more than 250 grantees, is that whether it's an organization, whether it's a, a content creator on TikTok that we found, whether it's a movie maker, a journalist, a blogger, a vlogger, it's that their stories and the work that they do offers a fresh perception of Africa. And it has been very, very, a very interesting journey because of course um, funding is not just so clear cut, right? It has its own dynamics there needs to be certain crosses and checks and balances in place. But what we have done is identify a few ways to support storytellers. Um, firstly, we do not necessarily prioritize having a track record of being funded before. So a lot of our um, grantees were actually, our partnership was the first time they got funded. And secondly, we also do not necessarily just look for projects that are big in terms of the money that it takes to fund them. We have my favorite grant called Kikere Grant. 
it's a Yoruba word for small, small, and it really is that it's a small fund, but with a big, big impact. Um, the grants are worth between 500 USD and 2,000 USD. And every year there's a call out for Kekere grants. It's always for performing artists. This includes poets, um, musicians, comedians as well. We have a comedy fund, we have a film fund, we have a media fund. And the most important thing with all our work in grant making especially, is that we want it to be impactful. Impactful doesn't just mean that work gets created. We support the community. We, we support the work that you do beyond funding. In fact, we love saying that, yes, funding is important. Yes, it takes money to tell stories, but our partnership will always go beyond money because it takes more than money to tell a story and to be sustainable. So once you join the, the, the fold as it were, the community through a grant, sometimes not through a grant. We see a storyteller as a bona fide partner. We find out what are your challenges, what is it that you need, what else can we do beyond money to make sure that your endeavors are successful. So we amplify, we use the networks that we have to amplify the work of our community. We connect our to market because again, money and sustain sustainability are important. We network, we know that as a funder, we get into rooms that storytellers might not necessarily be able to get into. And so we become the bridge between our community and the places that they want to go to that could sometimes include um, sending recommendations when they're applying for other grants and really being available to serve as a reference, being available to upskill them. We run workshops, um, which is my favorite part of my job probably, where I go to organizations and I to just talk about storytelling and why we need to change how we write and document Africa and how we can do that. We also have free online courses that we created to effect change. And these are all done through grant making, right? So we've partnered with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. It's a journalism foundation. We they got a grant from us to produce an online course that's free, it takes three hours to complete. And once you have completed it, if there are any journalists in the house, once you've completed it, you can pitch content to Bird Story Agency, which is another ANF supported project, and get paid to tell better stories about Africa. And I think this is such a beautiful example of how we work. We identify a need. The need in this case was that the media tells stereotypical stories about Africa. We did a research into this and found that most of the news that Africans know about Africa comes from foreign news sources like CNN, BBC, and they have, they have um, different agendas, right? They have different news, news agendas and it, they, it tends to be mostly conflict driven, mostly political and so we went back and started Bird Story Agency. It's Africa's only news agency for human interest stories, arts, culture, innovation, entrepreneurship, and so on. And Bird, um, another purpose that it serves really is that it's, it's able to incentivize the telling of better stories because we also do a lot of focus groups and community engagement. To, we, we know that we do not know anything. We might be in the virtual office and we might have the strategy and some funds, but it is the people who are on the ground working as the storytellers who really, really know what's happening and what their experiences are. We don't imagine them. So we do a lot of focus groups and in these focus groups, journalists were saying, yes, it's great. I'm interested in telling better stories about my country, but um, if I pitch a story to, to New York Times, for example, and I just want to tell them about these pioneering women in Cameroon, they're not gonna care. They just want the stories of gloom and hardship. So Bird has been able to incentivize and monetize the telling of better stories. Another way in which we fund um, is to, to look at the profile of who we fund. And even though we're only four years old, the more we are in this space, the more we realize that we really want to be disruptive. We really want to turn funding on its head. And one of the ways in which we were doing it is, I guess, best illustrated by 
this consistent feedback from our grantees. Besides that, it was the first time they got funded for stories. They also appreciate that they have the creative freedom to tell the stories that they want. We do not prescribe what stories um, grantees and, and our partners should tell. What we do ask for, though, is that that story absolutely changes and challenges stereotypical narratives of Africa. Another thing that we identified is that storytelling is not, it's not just traditional. You know, it's not just what you expect. A comedian is a storyteller. Comedy tells story, and comedy is, is very important. It has become one of the ways in which Africa is showing up in the world, the spotlight on African comedy with the existence of Trevor Noah. There's a whole relationship with Comedy Central and comedians in Africa. When we saw that trend, we decided to play around with the idea of funding stand-up comedy. So we started the Comedy Fund and partnered with six stand-up comics who are now at the tail end of the project. They worked with mentors and they have produced content that, they're being re that is being reviewed at the moment and will soon be out in the world. And then we decided to also fund film again from research that we did. We did research into youth perceptions about the continent, what they know, where they consume that information. And film was the only thing, the only type of content that young people across the continent consumed as much as they consumed American film and other films from Hollywood. So to put it in perspective, in our um, study, less than 4% of the people we sampled routinely read African literature for fun, but more than 60% of everyone we sampled routinely chooses to watch African film and African cinema for fun. But what we found was that in the, the content they consumed fed into some stereotypes, right? So we decided that no, we'll have a film fund so that we are able to support this great medium that has so much potential to tell the story of Africa and support storytellers, um, filmmakers in this case, who wanted to tell better stories about Africa. And again, the scope is vast. There's a film called Sixth Sense about a blind film, about a blind music producer from KZN actually, who just started making music, believing that one day his big break will come. It finally came, he broke into the overseas market. We have another one called The Language of My Soul. It's about the last remaining speaker of the new language, uh, Meg Hethrin, and the film asks what's going to happen to her language when she passes away. We have another film that's a horror story set in a tourist lodge in Kenya. So I'm mentioning what these films are so that you get a sense of how vast the ideas we support are, but also that essentially, while we are definitely prescriptive about being mission aligned, we are not prescriptive in any way at all about the content. And then another thing that we learn from our funding journey, grant making, was that another thing that we learned from our grant making and funding journey was that, you know, um, we all know that Africa is not one country. Africa is 54 countries, 55 if you include the, the Western Sahara, and it has language beyond just English, and it has countries beyond just Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria. Um, and we saw that a lot of our grantees, a lot of people who are applying, tend to come from these three countries. Most of them tend to use English. Again, we went back into the community and found out what, what we could do. And people asked um, that we become a bit more flexible. Initially, when you apply for a grant, you had to write, type out a form. Now you can do a voice note because some people are better speakers than they are writers. Um, if you need a translator available in a meeting when we've shortlisted, you're more than welcome to bring them. And if you need any support in any other way, you also are able to tell it to us. And then where possible, we will find ways to support you, to empower you, and just make sure that 
we we move away from the model of funding. You know, when you think about funding, you think about this, it is serious, but you think about this serious excursion, everything must be perfect, you must have a track record, you must be able to prove that the money is going to be well spent, all needed, all important for reporting as well. But at the same time, it can be prohibitive, it can be a stumbling block for some. That is why we are really, really mindful of being able to categorize what we fund and who we fund. So as a reminder, we fund content creators. I'm very proud that we now have funded four TikTokers. One is a comedian. <laughs> Thank you. One is a comedian. One is Marumbulu, who has a channel called Habarin Jema. It just tells good news about Africa. Another one is a fashion writer who uses um, costume from the 16th, 17th century to tell the story of Africa. So she's looking at what um, textiles in Southern Africa, dress styles in Southern Africa, and what that what that tells us about the history of the people and the place. And then we have another TikTok comedian who does animations on TikTok. Um, he uses them as entertainment. And then um, we also find musicians which is really great um, because, once again, you know, not everyone can book studio time, not everyone can be able to afford what it takes to make music, but um, we had three artists, musicians applying, and the ideas were great and they were funded, and in this case, it's not like how do you know that music changes the typical narratives of Africa, you know? It's about them doing something fresh, something different, something that's, that turns the game in its head, essentially. There's a musician from Kenya who plays an instrument that typically, traditionally, was only pay, played by men. Women are not supposed to play it. And she has a, a band, and that's what they pay. They're using these instruments and this sound that usually, that previously was gender and women were excluded from. And she's using that to tell her story. So that's the flexibility of the ideas that we tell. We have funded a food blogger to go around Senegal and Ivory Coast and a few other places on the continent, eating her way across the, the region and writing about the culinary culture and what, how we you know what food means, you know, because um, when, when you think about food in Africa, the common stereotype is, oh, Africans must be starving, right? But uh, on the other hand, like Salif Keita says in his song, Africa, manje boku, there is a lot of food. And we funded and partnered with Afrofood because of the work that they do speaks directly to that. I can really go on and on and on about the type of storytellers we find. But I'll end by saying um, what's important, I think. What's important is being mission aligned. Um, we find people who shift the stereotypical narratives of Africa and we look for a track record of telling those stories. Not necessarily a track record of being funded, but a track record of being mission aligned because we we want the work, we want to empower work that would continue with or without us. And then secondly, we decolonized language as a barrier. You can send an application form in any language of your choosing between French, Arabic, and po French, Arabic, English. We, we're looking into Portuguese right now, introducing that. And as we do that, it means if someone comes from Lusophone Africa and they've been shortlisted and they say, I'm not comfortable of conducting an interview in, in English, I'm better in Portuguese, it means we have to find a translator to join us and we're willing to do that. And then um, most importantly, we always offer more value than money. Yes, you will get that funding, but more than anything else, is the resources that you will get, you know, resources like networking through events where we connect our storytellers, or events where we we ask them to give you a platform. So if we have 
there's a committee, there's a comedy festival coming up and we now have stand-up comedians in our network. We're going to reach out to those festivals and introduce these people and look for platforms for them. We do capacity building through master classes. And again, the master classes come from not only do we need to upskill um, our community, everyone has learned from the University of YouTube a lot recently. And that knowledge matters. And Sometimes you can't access it as an individual. You cannot go to the writer of the Queen of Katwe and just say, hey, William, I have a script. Can you help me figure it out? You know, maybe he'll help you. He's a nice person, but chances are he won't have time. But ANF can go to him and say, hey, this is who we are. This is our community, and we'd like for you to come present a script writing masterclass. And he will gladly do that, right? Um, and, and that's the reason why we we have our master classes it's to upskill our community, but to not just upskill them, to, to work with some of the best brains, best talents in their fields, so that there's, there's direct and immediate impact from attending that master class. And then lastly, we are really flexible, even in our reporting. We always ask ourselves, how easier can we make it? Um, how much more? open can this process be because we want it to be a, a, a process that our grantees and our community experience as seamless, easy, inclusive, and that makes it able for them to deliver their projects without necessarily being bogged down by admin and red tape. Before I go, I'm going to ask you all to go to www.africanofilter.org and sign up to join our community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lerato. Talk about disruption. I stand here for one hour saying you need to write grant, and she says, send a voice note. <laughs> <laughs> That's disruption. So we have about 20 minutes left. I wanted to give opportunity for you to ask myself and Kirito Lerato any questions that you have. Uh, we'll keep it very brief so we can keep to time. Uh, Neuf has done an amazing job of keeping the time this year, so I'm not going to break that. So uh, can I have uh, both of them come up? We can finally use the stage they've set up for us, or we can stand here, whichever one. And if you have any questions, please, I think someone is going to be running mics around. We might be able to take maybe three questions for either of us. But if you don't have any questions, we can do it informally, and you can just come and chat with them. So. One. Sure. Or we can stand here, either one. You can one you want. Hmm? You can sit there, yes. Let's make it let's keep it informal. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this amazing um, conversation. My question goes to Africa No Filter. You did mention that you fund content creators um, that are able to tell story stories that reflect who Af what Africa is. And um, so my question is, what if a content creator has a very good project but doesn't have enough following on social media? Like, is there going to be a compromise to work with that person for the sake of the powerful story the person has? And will there be follow up to see how the person can build his or her community online so that she or he can have better outreach? Or will it just be, okay, we just want content creators that have enough followers? Thank you. Thank you. We actually don't look at followers in that super nuanced way. Usually we just say if you have a combined audience of 5,000 across those social media platforms, so you might find that perhaps you're stronger on YouTube, but on TikTok you have 200. We st you know, if, if you're mission aligned and if your project is what we fund, we're likely to fund you. We will not say we won't fund a storyteller because their numbers are low. What we do do, though, is to identify certain gaps, right? Uh, you're a content creator. So your social media should really be a bit more active than a usual person who's not using it as a as a platform for you know creating and curating content. So we give feedback. If if you you, you become successful, 
and perhaps your, your, your social media is really low, we have offered social media training for a few people before people have asked. We've offered that to them, we've given them tips and skills, and we use our social platforms to only, only amplify our community. So we are supporting the growth of that platform. Secondly, there's someone who applied for for funding recently, and her, her, her blog was great, you know, but unfortunately she hadn't built the blog. She had like just five stories, and she's writing about Somalia, and we're like, oh, great application, but you just have not invested that time in building this platform. We went back to her and said, you know, we really, really like your idea, but this is missing, it's missing consistency, it's missing a lot of content, so go back to the drawing board, think through, content plans, think through the stories that you really want to tell, that you can tell around you now without funding that allows you to crowd in content so that when you apply again, you are applying and using as a showcase a platform that doesn't just have five stories. Hi, um, I had a question for Lorato again. Um, yeah, she had mentioned something about um, you look at the person's track record um, and whether they have a track record of telling positive stories. Um, what if um, I'm someone who is a journalist and like sometimes working in the media, you have to tell a lot of bad stories because that's the rea reality that you're facing. And like, I'm tired of telling those bad stories. So what do I do now? Am I going to be disqualified because I have this track record of reporting on bad stories, but like now I have an idea to tell something good um, I don't know. Thank you for that question. Um, unfortunately, we fund mission-aligned storytellers. We need to see that track record. It's important because we, we ask ourselves this question. Imagine we didn't exist three years down the line. The work will still need to continue, and the work is continued by people who are already invested in it and doing it with or without funding. However, this is what we do. We also believe that you need to tell difficult stories better. So we do find, and we've partnered with journalists who are not telling um, arts, culture, innovation. They were telling difficult stories, but the, the difference was that they use solutions journalism. They use constructive journalism. So they were telling a difficult story, but instead of framing it in a negative way that reinforces stereotypes, they were illuminating community actions. They were showing agency. They were going deeper into an issue and unpacking it. So that's, that's very important, and it doesn't mean that a journalist who tells hard news can't be funded, but it is how you tell your stories that determines if you are a potential partner for Africa No Filter. Thank you a lot, Uncle Paul. So um, uh, I just have a very short, it might, you, you may not be uh, that person directly, but maybe you can guide me. So at what point do the presentation, do the skills that you have shared changes for a scientist? Again, as I said earlier on, it was, mine is more creative. Scientists, when they apply for grants, are more data driven. Uh, you, 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 you know, there is a, a scientific process that you have to go through. Uh, so, you know, in, in your case, for example, if you have a, an idea for science, I can connect you with some of our, because we also do science grants at NAGEO, and they can be able to give you uh, some guidelines on that. But really, the skills of selling yourself doesn't change. You have to do that either as a creative or a scientist. The skills of, you know, uh, Finding a solution you're trying to solve doesn't change. You need to make sure that, again, that it's mission aligned with that solution. But, you know, the, the, the writing style might change. You know, in this case now, uh, I might be telling stories about my production, but you need to talk about data, you need to talk about evidence, you need to talk about all those things. That is where the writing style might be, where the big change happens. Okay? Okay, 
Thank you. Um, just a quick question, um, and it's not for anyone in particular, but any of the three of you can help to answer. I just want to ask what advice you have for people like us, and that's, I'm assuming that it's just, just me, and this is no offense to those who are career filmmakers. Um, what do you advice do you have for someone who is um, doing films for the love of it? And, um, and not just for the love of it, and mainly because, um, for example, I'm a conservationist, and I feel like um, beyond being passionate about filmmaking or communication, I feel like we have the need for it because for, I work in Nigeria, Africa's most populous country. Of course, we're doing conservation, we're creating protected areas, and um, we have a unique story to tell because we are an indigenous organization that the only indigenous organization that has created and is managing protected areas in the country. And, um, um, and I feel like we have a unique story to tell. And for those areas to be sustainable, that huge population needs to be aware of the work we're doing. So besides doing film for the love of it, is doing film because it's needed. And um, rather than outsourcing that, um, one of the issues we have is that the areas where we work are pretty dangerous. So um, it's at core and it's really hard to get filmmakers who work with you there, whether you do your own story. So what advice would you have? Because it's not what we do for a living, it's what we do because we love it and we, want to, we need to do it. Thank you so much. I think I'll, I'll talk about it and then I'll also give Kiroto the opportunity. Uh, I mean, that's actually a very good question because what you do is important. The story of your work needs to be told. But as you've indicated, you're not a filmmaker, you're not a storyteller. Does it make you any less significant? No, it doesn't. But the reality, the reality is that when a grant maker is looking at a grant, we've talked about the word mission alignment. Your work might align with the mission, but, your, but does your skill align with the mission? Your skill as a conservationist aligns, but as a storyteller does it. So that's why you start looking for partnerships. Because really, uh, when somebody's looking through a grant, they look at your history of work in that area. You have a good history as a conservationist. And if I'm looking at a conservation grant, definitely. But as a storyteller, I think I'll be more, much more comfortable. Instead of telling you to go and build your storytelling skills, partner with somebody else that, again, will be able to tell your conservation story with their storytelling skills and then come together as a team. That's a better way to succeed in such a uh, situation. Um, sure. Uh, thanks, Paul, and thank you for your question. And I just have one thing that's been sitting on my mind. You know, I came here and I talked about Luminate and, you know, civic and political rights and all that, which is great. But at oftentimes, environmentalists and co people in conservation tend to feel left out. I should also mention I'm, an I'm a retired environmentalist. Um, but I bring it back to your point. Our colleagues in Latin America have made environmental rights, civic and political rights. When you're discussing things about the Amazon in Brazil, it's a political issue, it's an identity issue, it's an environmental issue. We need to do the same here. And our colleagues, um, one of our grantees at DocuBox, they, they supported a film called I Am Samuel, which was documenting climate change in a very arid part of Kenya. And what came from that film was that there was a resolution to build a sand dam to restore water and aid in water conservation. So that's just showing the link between environmental issues and civic, becoming civic issues, which are also by extension political issues. So to your work that you're talking about, you're already working in a dangerous area. And when you were speaking about what you're doing, I was already thinking about the different ways you can present your work. It is talking about the difficulty of accessing these areas because of security. It's talking about how committed you are and because it's an identity issue, you're talking about how you want to portray this and how you're seeing you know, the issues of land governance operating in the protected zones of Nigeria. So there are very w many ways to expand your definition of a film 
it may be an environmental film at its core, but it's touching on so many other issues because that's just the nature of, of the environment and the natural space and world that we live in. So just expand your view on how you're talking about your issue. Therefore, you can get the right partners to support you. Because when you're out there doing your film in the remote area, you can work with a local organization and they will finally see, you see how hard it was to come up here? Can you please use your film to tell people how hard it is to come here? Therefore, the government will listen to us more when we say we need better security. And that was from your film that was probably talking about rain or a specific kind of tree. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to end. I've been given the sign that we've, uh, we've gone too far. But uh, thank you so much. I hope this has been useful. Uh, thank uh, my two colleagues that came in to join us for this. Uh, I'm still available for some one-on-ones uh, from now to 5.30. I think Steph is going to put me somewhere. So if you still need to talk to me, uh, if you need to talk to Kiroto or Larato, I'm sure I'll ask them to stick around so you can also have uh, some conversations with them. Again, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful needed session. Um, apologies if I'm not always here and I'm sometimes in the other room because I'm just like, oh, the noise. Um, to combat the other sounds, we're going to play our own sounds. And we're starting with just a few clips to exemplify what the podcast is, both in interview form and in narrative audio. Um, so we'll start with Kevin's. Kevin, do you want to say just a few quick words for him? Sure, sure. Why not? Um, so this is a a new series that I've done as a, so I'm a podcaster and my podcast is called The Creative Life Series and after living in Nairobi for the last three years, I met so many amazing people that I thought that I needed to do a series that was um, with experts from Africa, about Africa, who lived in Africa. And so that series is called Africa X and so this was the trailer that I did for it. I got nine, I got nine different languages on there and also got some really good music things like that, produced it myself by Cat, you know, produced like over a thousand episodes, over 30 million downloads for clients, and so, you know, we're kindred spirits, so this is um, the promo trailer for uh, Africa X, one of those The Create Your Life series presents Africa X, a special series focused on conversations and experiences with experts from Africa, in Africa, about Africa. And I'm your host, Kevin Y. Brown. Africa X. Create your life. Create your life.
it's an interview series, right? Yes. It's an interview series. Okay, super cool. We're going to circle back um, and talk a little bit more about the difference between an interview series and a narrative series. Um, and what Perlin and I did was just eight parts, and it's narrative. And we're going to play the first three and a half minutes of the episode. So if you'd like, you can shut your eyes and use what I like to call your amazing theater of the mind. So this is very much imaginary art or imaginative art in that we co-produce the work alongside you, the listener. There's no visuals on the screen for our creations. And so what we need all of you to do is to supplement that with um, whatever your mind's eye creates. So please relax, feel comfortable. We're gonna sit here for three minutes and I hope you like this. This is the third part of an eight-part series. So it's kind of starting in the middle of a few things. and. Um, Definitely be sure to compliment Curlin on his voice later on. <laughs> if you're just joining us, this podcast is serialized, so it is best enjoyed listening to episodes in order. Go back, start at the beginning, we'll be right here. Also, as a caution, there are some graphic scenes in this episode. This is one voice in a town called Tempwe. The voice belongs to a woman named Lourdes Masozi. She sits on a plastic chair in a church. It's so dark, I can barely make out the faces of the 50 girls and women around her. Tempwe is a remote village in southeastern Angola, perched atop a hill and defended on all sides by forests and a moat of landmines. Tempwe looks and feels like a castle. Success in protecting the source lakes in Angola hinge on this one place. We need the acceptance and approval of the residents. Trust is the highest currency, and we don't fully have it yet. Tempoy <laughs> has more churches than I can count. All around us, there is music and rhythm and percussion. You can hear it in the way people make their food. This is the sound of cassava being pounded into flour with a giant mortar and pestle. Oh, that was nice. Oh, that was I think I'm supposed to like stand up here and keep it alive. <laughs> Everything in and around Tempwe becomes either a tool or an instrument. This, for instance, is a drum made out of a hollow bomb casing. But the rhythm that I hear the most is this. It looks like a group of people clapping and nodding. But it is actually a greeting tradition in Eastern Angola. When people meet, they share where they've come from and what they've seen. As one person speaks, the rest tag along. They clap. And they say, Ensha, Ewa, after each completed thought. This is a signal of acknowledgement, a way of showing that they've really heard what the other person has said. Even the act of listening has its own soundtrack. People from all over the region stop in Tempo to see family and share what they've seen, to engage in Ujimbo and say, Ensha, Ewa, in churches, backyards, and streets. Tempo is a town of 1,000 voices, communicating 1,000 different perspectives. And our mission is to try and understand them all. Okay, that's all we'll take for now. It's like, I've 
actually never played that in front of a live audience, <laughs> so I could just feel my heart in my throat. Um, especially an audience who is familiar with, um, at least in, in, in some ways, with the place and the music. Um, because so, so often I've just been around people from the United States. So this is really special. Thank you for letting me do that. And um, I think this really allows us to think through what a podcast is. Just like saying what's a, a written, you know, like what's a piece of writing? It could be a blog, it could be a book, it could be um, a caption on an Instagram feed. There's so many options for audio. It really is a medium. And so you can have a super produced audio series like what we did in Guardians of the River where it's, it's kind of like a, a documentary with many steps. Um, you can have really lightweight interview podcast episodes where you're talking to somebody different and it's maybe an hour. And then you can have something in between, which is um, what, what it sounds like Kevin was able to do. So in our case, um, I know a lot of you are filmmakers. The beauty of a podcast for us was that we had um, an established group of characters. We had a film that had already built a lot of rapport in the region, and it had only done like <laughs> into the Okavangos. How long, Carlin? Uh, documentary. Yeah. Uh, I think it's about two hours. Eh? Yeah, it's a little under two hours. So it had covered about two hours of a story, but through the podcast medium, we were able able to get closer to eight, nine hours and really dive into so many things that the documentary couldn't in each of these different episodes. Um, so what we did is we picked up where the film left off and we explored many issues that the film wasn't able to do. So that's how a podcast made sense for us. And then just pragmatically, you may notice, like I was lying down when I was listening, but people are driving, they're cooking, they're washing the dishes. It's a medium that moves with you and very often in polls, um, we're finding at the end of the day, people are kind of tired and don't always want to sit down and watch like a heavy hitting nature documentary. But with podcasts, people will flip that on and they can really tap into that casually throughout their day. And so it's a great way to, especially in the world of science and environmental and issue driven things, people are going to podcast for their politics. They are going to podcast for their information. They are going to podcast for their self betterment. So it's a great medium for getting your story across. So that's my answer for both of you. Why? What? Uh, what's a podcast? Um, I don't know. I think things mean different things for each one of us. But being Angolan, being African, having grown up in the reality in which I did civil war and a lot of things, I like to say that a podcast is like you know the African oral tradition, where if you sit with an elder, you know, let's say. 7 p.m. around fire, and you're listening to your grandfather telling some story. It might be a myth, but by listening to his voice, you are sort of absorbing the essence and the energy of the person. Whereas, for example, if you're reading, you'll create that energy and essence for yourself. You're not getting it from the writing, but when you're listening, you're actually absorbing the essence of the person, the energy the sensations that the person experienced uh, when he experienced whatever he's telling about. So I think really podcasts are our connection to oral tradition, which is really an essence of a lot of parts of Africa. Love that. That's a tough, uh, tough answer to follow. Um, <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, podcasting and part of the reason why I even wanted to move to Africa was I thought that podcasting was a low cost way to be able to preserve uh, history, tradition, language, and also culture. And the, I think the beauty of it is that you can um, do it in audio and video format. But I really look at it as a way for future generations to have an authentic experience, right, um, according to what was recorded and had happened before they got here. Right, because as we know, a lot of times history is rewritten, or it's not there for us to be able to use as a um, as a benchmark as to what we can go on and do. So, and it's something that we can access all over the internet, um, and you know, for generations to come. So, like Kerlin was saying, you know, and it's also an opportunity to be able to connect and to hear and experience how other people feel and um, are. So that would be my definition. Okay, clearly we're podcasters because we're like, what's a podcast? Also, why a podcast? We kind of jumped ahead um, because it's fun. Um, 
I think I, I gave a big why. Um, and I, I guess I have a personal story that also plays into it. Uh, when I was 15, my dad had um, a, a very rapidly progressing form of cancer where it was moving through his spinal fluid and I would come home from school and every day he would lose a, a certain ability. It's like one day I came home from school and he really couldn't walk again. It was, that was it, he just couldn't get up. And then the next day I came home from school and he couldn't open his eyes. And so there he was um, next to our front door and alive, but it was very hard to interact with him. And after I finished my homework, I would just sit by his bed and read him all of my favorite books that we had read as a child. And he was an older man, so it was like kind of morbid books like Edgar Allan, Edgar Allan Poe, and um, he loved this illustrator named Arthur Rackham who does these goblins, and I would narrate the goblins to him. And um, you could just tell by the sound of my voice, his face would relax and his body would ease. And eventually he passed away. And um, now I'm in a time in my life where it feels like so many of my friends are pregnant. And they'll encourage you to, <laughs> big switch. <laughs> they'll, they'll encourage you to talk to their bellies that babies can hear up to eight to 12 weeks um, in the gestation period. And then when they're born, even though they can't really see in front of their faces, they can identify voices very clearly. And so my why, since the very beginning for me, has always been that physically and sense, speaking in terms of senses, for many people, we come into this world listening. And it's one of the last things we do before we die. When so many of our other senses are not refined, we know and we know how to hear. And so much of what I love in audio is reenacting that, um, reinvigorating that, because I think we think we live in this visual world where that's how so much is communicated. But think about the way you feel when you hear music, especially something from your childhood. Think about the way you feel when you hear something that really stands out. I think it's an amazing opportunity to touch on people's emotions in a way that when we're often like desensitized from the visuals. So that's my why. Gentlemen. <laughs> I think my why is a mix of a little bit of yours and a little bit of Kevin's. Um, like I said, uh, listening to, it can be an elder or even a, a child, it, it connects you with what that person is feeling. But also from my background, you know, and witnessing for the past 15 years, very rural, very remote, disconnected villages, I feel like a podcast is a meme to actually eternalize people's voices, tales, stories, myths, and to eternalize African tradition. I like to say that, I like to challenge the concept that formal Western education, where you go to university, has more value than sitting with another at the village. I don't think it has, but you need to absorb. And in order to push that narrative, to eternalize those voices, those stories, that tradition, a podcast is a great mean to to record that, but if you think a little bit more, um, even scientifically, everything is a result of you know magnetic waves around them, sound waves. Everything is a reflection of that. We are just a physical manifestation of that. And if you think to that manner, that's a scientific description. But if you listen to the elders, they're speaking the same thing, but speaking about your soul, how your soul is affected by the sound, story that this person is emitting. So I think it's a great way for us Africans, particularly, to internalize our tradition, our stories, our essence, our incredible knowledge. Yeah. I guess I would just add something from round of applause. I would just add something uh, very small, and I would say that, you know, a part of my reasoning for podcasting is to serve. Um, you know, my way, my podcast kind of started off as a um, as a radio show, and because I was a professional speaker, and so I was always offering value, and so I, I got into podcasting, you know, into radio, in order to be able to offer value to people on a continuous basis and have more touch points. And so I think that you know what I mean. A large part of the why is like to really be able to help people, give them tangible steps from people who have done things that they want to do, to be able to walk away and create a better life. For themselves, so that is a big part of the why in which you 
you know, I'm interested in podcasting and have been at it for a while. Yep. Awesome. Okay, so I think we'll try and move a little quicker so we have time for questions. Where do you start? Um, for me, and working with most of my clients or projects, um, I always start with the community for Kevin's um, Kevin's why. Podcasts are a community of communities. Um, it's one of these things where no one is going to listen if they either don't connect somehow with the content in the show or connect to the person behind the mic. We like to hear some sort of connection with. Like that's that's pretty fundamental and. Um, Podcasts generally are very service oriented. We're answering questions. We are um, providing someone comfort in a time of solitude. Um, they're, we're, it's such an intimate medium that moves with you. And so people have to choose to want to listen. They don't want to be preached to. And so really understanding the community is super important. Um, having a goal is also pretty critical. So you know what your North Star is. You know what your why is, why, why you want to make the show. It's generally an idea. And then having a sense of your budget to help determine what kind of show you can make, what's feasible. Whenever um, I'm about to start on the podcast, and when I have a theory, I feel like people, they use you podcast for three reasons. To increase your income, leads, or authority. If you're like, oh, this is a project I'm passionate about.
can just like swipe your work and then re-upload it. So we don't encourage that. It also like can really mess with your listener numbers. But uh, we did partner with radio stations in Angola and Botswana and South Africa and across the United States to air it. We did episodes in Botswana and in Portuguese um, for the local communities. We did live listenings, and then Curlin can speak more, but in Luanda, he partnered with a local studio to do events around it. Um, and yeah, it's uh, in terms of the data piece, super frustrating and applied for multiple grants to come up with a better way because the way I calculated it is the cost of downloading one episode of Guardians of the River in Botswana is three meals. So um, the African continent, and obviously some countries more than others have the most expensive data on the planet, and that does make downloading pods episodes really prohibitive. But I know it's something Afropods have been working on, and Curlin has more experience too. So it's a great question. We have not solved it, but there's a ton that can still be done, whether it's live listening, working with radio stations, the blah, 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 blah. Okay, Yeah, one of the main reasons for us trying to create the podcast, actually, from the Angolan side, is because we are a very radio country. So during the Civil War, everyone was listening to the status of the war. So even now, today, in remote parts of the forest, you have the elder at 6 p.m. listening to Voice of America. So that was one of the main reasons. But... Like we said, you, I think you first need to create something that sort of proves your idea, your concept. That's why we firstly did it in English. We did one episode in Portuguese dedicated to, to Angola, and maybe there's some obstacles to it, but maybe one of the next ideals would be to produce something in local language and just it in the radio. So, okay. I'll, just add, I'll add one small thing. I work for Africa and we're a platform that is touching all the countries. Vernacular podcasts are actually on us yeah. and have been becoming more and more popular. So if you can do a podcast in vernacular, we highly encourage it. Our platform actually, I think we are capable of, or we have like the opportunity to register your podcast in over 70 languages. So Africa is becoming Africa inclusive and Africa focused for the African.
and talk list of microphones that I would like um, that are well out of my price range. Um, and then, God, what was the other technical question? Oh, then, okay, so you were saying about all their noises. Um, let it happen in a vacuum. So oftentimes, if you're doing voiceover, it is good to have that be quiet because it can be distracting. But for so much, I actually really lean into the texture of what's happening. There's a scene in Guardians of the River where there's a woman, um, four women, holding down a goat with one of the women stuffing her hand through the stomach and pulling out the stomach of a live goat. And we're doing an interview with that in the background. And I did not cut that. In fact, I kept it and was like, oh, that's a sound. And you can hear it. It has very little to do with what's going on. But it allows the scene that, like, this is where we are. We're in a marketplace. We're searching out bush meat. We're trying to understand how local people live. Um, I definitely don't want to be like, hey, lady, can you hold your goat stomach yanking for another time? Um, I think the whole piece for sure. And I've heard from many people that it's a nightmare sound for them which for some reason makes me feel better. <laughs> so yeah, I would say don't worry too much, but if you notice there's just very annoying noises, try to reduce them, and if you can't reduce them, write to them, because it lets people be on the journey. Um, yeah. Anything else? Was there anything I missed that went through that list? I, I think the lady did it on purpose, because you were asking if you were pushing No, they were doing it too loud. Yeah, you never know, though. You never know. I definitely impacted the environment we were in, and I stood out like a sore thumb. Um, and oh, do we have time for one more? No. Are, are they kicking us out? Okay. <laughs> the nicest I've ever. I'm like so nervous about public speaking because I just love pre-recorded tapes. <laughs> thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Okay. Thank you. This is me, Christian. And um, just this is the talks with you know.
the fascinating thing is that so many of the gestures used by the chimps are the same as ours. It's really important for people to understand their origins and where we came from and why we came to be what we are. If we don't do something now, if we don't do it today, we can forget about it. It is our responsibility as the two-leggeds to try to foster good relationships with the Earth. We are fixing most of the bad things that we did in the past. We're going to be pushing the envelope to improve our understanding of climate change. It is very important that we learn from the people who have been the custodians of this environment. Women in our society face limitations in education. My goal is to change that. Stories are fundamental to our very existence as human beings and there's nothing more impactful than a good story. Huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I am not so happy about that round of applause. Please, more thunderous, more purposeful. Dumelang, Dumelang. Well, good evening and welcome to this auspicious occasion. And I think it's auspicious on many levels, one of which is the fact that it's the 29th of February today. It happens every four years. So this year being a leap year, we're celebrating. Anyone here celebrating their birthday on the 29th, by the way? Yeah? I, I, I don't quite believe that. I don't quite believe that, but yeah, to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, this evening is, of course, the South Africa premiere of Nkashi, Race for the Aquavango. And this is a film that's curated by the Impact Story Lab, which is an award-winning creative unit within National Geographic Society. But before we get into that, I just want to say, you're beautiful. You have represented and internalized the theme in your blue, white, and black impressions. A round of applause for yourself. Unilate, if you can. So, my name is Tumisa Mote. I am a radio broadcaster. I am a voiceover artist. I'm actually the 2020 NUF Narrators Challenge winner. Yes. And you'll find out why very soon. But I'm also going to be succeeding Sir David Attenborough when he decides to leave the scene. So, so Rala Mohela Bahed, so Rala Mohela, this is a night to celebrate with us, Botswana, that are here. And I do have my countrymen that I want to celebrate this evening before we get into anything. Rufus Molefe, where are you? Right, she's right there. She's um, a passionate producer and photographer with further uh, dedication to uncovering strange and weird things, she says. You know, that's some of the, the fascination that she finds in her work. She has served as both a director and writer for her documentary film, Whispers of the Delta, and has contributed to the storytelling team for Nat Geo's annual Delta Crossing Expedition 2022. Another round of applause for her. <laughs> Where are you? Right. So my, my namesake there is very decorated, but one of the things that I want to mention, of course, is as a new fellow and an African science film fellow, she, she continues to excel. 
Her debut short film made history as a first from Botswana to be featured at the Keynes Film Festival. So, now I'd like to introduce you to Palifang Charles, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how much of an introduction he needs, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all uh, had an opportunity to interact with him, but he's a National Ge Geographic uh, explorer based in Botswana, a photographer, writer, journalist, producer, and storyteller with 16 years experience in journalism. Now he's focusing on storytelling for the Okavango Delta uh, and some of the conservation initiatives. And of course, he's going to be sharing with us his participation and contribution to Nkashi very soon. But he's also here with alumni of the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project. Uh, so wherever they are, please just wave. Right there, right here. Right. Right. So. We also have um, those who participated in the National Geographic Photo Camp. So we saw them earlier. They were holding cameras around their necks. Where are you? Right, there they are. Round of applause to them. Allow me to introduce you now to Karabo Muilwa. Karabo Muilwa, where are you? He's right there at the back, ladies and gentlemen. Based in Maung, Botswana, a prominent wildlife photographer and storyteller advocating for conservation. So he's contributed to Discover, Discover Botswana and BBC Wildlife magazines, among many other things that he does, an opportunity to also hang out with him on the sidelines. Irene Sean. Irene, she's right here. Seasoned journalist at Botswana Guardian, the Midweek Sun, specializing in environmental lifestyle science and health reporting. And she's also one person that is so decorated, you might want to have an opportunity to talk to her. The next two, I'm not going to introduce now because later they will introduce themselves, but allow for me to welcome you yet again, ladies and gentlemen, to this beautiful evening. And perhaps to just give us context about what we are going to be uh, enjoying and appreciating this evening, allow for me to welcome up here the Chief Storytelling Officer at National Geographic Society, Caitlin Yano. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Botswana night. Um, I am just so excited that we get to bring this film home um, to the NUF community and to this group. Um, so many of you have seen this film many times, but we haven't seen it all collectively as a community. So we're just so excited to see it. And before we get to that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Impact Story Lab that you saw the sizzle for earlier. Um, it's a group within National Geographic Society. It's our in-house production team um, with the express purpose of making impact with media. So we do films and VR and podcasts and photography projects and we're just gonna soon launch a record label, too. More about that in a second. But um, when we decided we wanted to make this film for impact with our partners and explorers at the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project, we knew that it was really, really crucial if we were gonna have impact that we made this film with Botswana filmmakers for a Botswana audience. And so that meant approaching filmmaking, you know, from the ground there. So we'll talk more about that later, and it's evident in the film how we did it, and we're very excited to have one of the producers here with us. But please don't tell the rest of the crew this, but my favorite part of the film is the music. And we knew that if we were going to make this authentic and make it work with Botswana audiences, that the sounds had to be real and authentic. So we were already thinking this. We were already there. And because we were on the ground and had a local crew, we were talking about who we're going to get to score this film, what are we going to do? And they were like, you know, there's this guy. He's kind of a kid. But he's got a hit song on the radio, and he happens to be from, like, here. And I'm like, oh, Botswana? No, right here. Like this place, Saronga. And so with that, we met Tato. And it was really evident that he was going to be a huge part of this film. He's from there. He's authentic to um, the Delta. So that was great. And then we heard about the Compose Yourself Lab. 
And we started working closer, and we thought, how could we knit some of National Geographic's big programs together? So, hence an incredible collaboration was born between the production of Nkashi, Tato, and his musical genius, and then the Composer's Lab. So, before I, it's really weird to stand here and describe music, right? So before we do much more of that, I want to share, this is the first time we're ever showing this because we're holding it back for when we release the soundtrack um, for Impact as well. But this is the behind the scenes making of the sounds of Nkashi.
woods and verdant wetlands cradle the waning light of the day, a dance of eternal longing between the fading shadows and the yawning sun. Here, within nature's poetry, life's essence pulses like the veins of the earth, and each creature a storyteller in the grand narrative of existence. Pula. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to use my voice to capture some of the beauty that I feel every time I'm in the Okavango Delta. But it goes a long way. Now you have people that have been invested in making that happen. And so tonight, I hope that you can have a similar feeling as the one that I've just shared with you. Before we continue, I'm going to call back Caitlin because she has something to share with all of us. Actually, something that she wanted to share earlier. Well, this man triggered my memory because he said, does anyone have a birthday on February 29th? And I'd be remiss if I didn't say the director of the film, Sarah Joseph, who can't be here tonight, birthday is today. <laughs> so I think she's watching remotely and we'll send this to her, but happy birthday to the director of the film, the leap year baby um, who, who made this possible. Yeah, all right. Are you guys, and we're ready, we wanna. Next up.
Another round of applause for Cool Cat Mutiko, Mr. Sir.